to the government of Ukraine directly and through proxies. That's what I understood. And as you understand it, under whose authority do you think Mr. Giuliani was acting under? Congresswoman, I don't know. Did the Ukrainian officials you spoke to understand that Mr. Giuliani was telling them to investigate Vice President Biden's son and debunk the 2016 conspiracy theories? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Do you think that the Ukrainian officials that you spoke to understood the underlining meaning of Mr. Giuliani's advances to be both investigating the Bidens as well as debunking the 2016 conspiracy theories? Yes, I think to be clear, I think you're referring to debunking that it was a Russian interference. Exactly. And somehow implicating themselves that it was Ukrainian interference. I'm not sure. Exactly. Now, was this official U.S. foreign policy to push for investigation into the Bidens? It was not part of any process that I participated in. Now, Ms. Williams, do you agree that pressing these two investigations was inconsistent with official U.S. Ukraine policy? Obviously, anti-corruption reforms is a big part of our policy. I understand. I was not in a position to determine whether these particular investigations were appropriate. That's fair. Colonel, is it true that President Trump directed the Ukrainian president on the call on July 25th to work with Mr. Giuliani on these investigations? That is correct. In fact, Mr. Giuliani has made no secret of the fact that he is acting on behalf of President Trump. As Mr. Giuliani told the New York Times, and I'm going to put this on the screen, he told them, quote, my only client is the president of the United States. He's the one I have the obligation to report to, tell him and to tell him what happened. Stop right there just for a second. That way my viewers can take time to read this report. Let's move on. Fixing to go over into part four. Part four of the second ledger. Part four. He added that the investigations would be, quote, very, very helpful to my client and may turn out to be helpful to my government, end quote. Colonel, is it fair to say that the Ukrainian officials that you are on a daily basis, well, you're in contact with given your portfolio, were concerned about Mr. Giuliani's advances? Yes, they were. In your assessment, did they understand the political nature of the request being asked of them? I believe they did. Did they understand that it was affecting U.S. domestic policy? I'm not sure what they frankly understood about U.S. I think they understood the implications. Yes. You testified earlier that you warned the Ukrainians not to get involved in U.S. domestic policy. Is that right? I counseled them. Yes. Counseled them. In fact, you testified that that they they that you felt like it was important that you were espousing not just what you thought, but 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 tradition and policy of the United States to say that. It is what I knew for a fact to be U.S. policy. Now, why do you think it's important that for foreign governments not to get involved in political affairs of a nation like the United States? Congressman, the first thought that comes to mind is Russian interference and interference in 2016. 
the um, imp impact that had on uh, internal politics and the consequences it had for Russia itself. Exactly. This administration uh, uh, enforced pol uh, sanctions, heavy sanctions against uh, Russia for their interference, and that would not be in U.S. policy too. And so, Mr. Mr. Colonel, I'm running out of time. I understand. Um, is it is it normal for the for a private citizen, a non-U.S. government official, to get involved in foreign policy and foreign affairs like Mr. Giuliani? I don't know if I have the experience to say that, but uh, it certainly wasn't helpful, and it didn't help advance U.S. security interests. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You'll back. Mr. Turner. Ms. Williams, Lieutenant Colonel Vindeman, I want to thank you also for your service. Uh, your knowledge and expertise is incredibly important as we look to formulating policy uh, with both our allies and um, to try to counter uh, those who are not our allies. Um, I think we're all very concerned about our European policy and how it can thwart Russian aggression. Um, Ms. Williams, and you are responsible, as you said, as part of your portfolio, you advise the Vice President about Ukraine, correct? Correct. Lieutenant Colonel Vitteman, you said that you are the principal, in your opening you say you are the principal advisor to the President on Ukraine and you uh, coordinate U.S.-Ukraine policy, correct? Uh, Congressman, I, in this um, statement I issued this morning, I, I probably eased that back. I took that off my de job description that I have on my eval. But I certainly spent much more time advising the ambassador than I did the president. I don't but, it, but your statement, as you submitted it and read it today, says, at the NSC, I am the principal advisor to the national security advisor and the president on Ukraine, correct? That, that is not what I read into the transcript. That might have been what, what I had in there yesterday when I was drafting it, but I chose to ease back <laughs> uh, on that language, even though it was in my evaluation just because I didn't want to overstate my role. You wrote what I just read. But, Congressman, what I'm saying is what I read into the, the record this morning uh, didn't say that. Okay. Noted. Um, because you know Ukraine, you know that we work through our allies and our multilateral relations, and you know that um, the Ukraine is an aspiring member of the EU and NATO, right, Ms. Williams? Yes, that's correct. Lieutenant Colonel Vindeman? Yes, correct. And you know that probably that the EU and the NATO and NATO both have offices in the Ukraine and that we try to advance our policy with the EU and NATO. And you would agree that our Ambassador K. Billy Hutchinson and Ambassador Sondland would be responsible for advancing our policy interests with Ukraine at the EU and at NATO. Right, Ms. Williams? I would say that certainly in terms of this specific relationship between NATO and Ukraine, that would, would fall to Ambassador Hutchison and between the EU and Ukraine uh, to Ambassador Sondland. But obviously we have an ambassador in Ukraine as well. Right. Lieutenant Colonel Vindeman, you would agree? I agree with uh, Ms. Williams. Great. Um, now, <clears throat> Lieutenant Colonel, you said in your written statement that Mayor Rudolph Giuliani um, promoted false information that undermined the United States-Ukraine policy. Have you ever met Giuliani? Uh, just to be, again, accurate, I said false narrative just because uh, that's what I said in the record this morning, but okay. I have not met him. And so you've never had a conversation with him about Ukraine or been in a meeting where him, where, with him where he has spoken to others about Ukraine? Uh, no, just what I saw him, um, um, you know, his comments on TV. So news and reports. News, yes. And similarly, you've never met the President of the United States, right? That is correct. So you've never advised the President of the United States on Ukraine? Uh, I, I advised him indirectly. I made all his preparations for the calls. and. But you, you've engagement. never spoken to the President of the United States and, and told him advice on Ukraine? That is correct. So on, in your written Not statement, you said in May I attended the inauguration of President Zelensky as part of the President delegation led by Secretary Perry. Following the visit, the members of the delegation provided President Trump a debriefing. Well, that's not really accurate, right? Because the members didn't, because you were a member, but you weren't in that meeting, were you? That is correct. Okay, so we'll just have a note there that that, that meeting occurred without you. Now, you do know that this impeachment inquiry is about the President of the United States, don't you? I, I, I do, Representative. Excellent. <clears throat> Now, you've said that you're responsible for coordinating U.S.-Ukrainian policy. Correct. Does the Secretary of State Pompeo report to you? Uh, he does not. Ambassador Volker? He does not. We coordinate. Uh, Ambassador of Ukraine, EU, NATO, Assistant Secretary for Europe, anyone at DOD report to you with respect to your responsibilities of, of coordinating U.S. policy with Ukraine? Congressman, at my level, I convene what's called a sub-policy coordinating committee. 
that deputy assistant secretary, I coordinate with, I chair those meetings. And Does I anybody need meetings. your approval in your role on Ukraine policy to formulate Ukraine policy? Do they seek your approval? According to the um, NSPM4, the policy signed by the president, uh, so he policy gets to should do be it. coordinated by the, he by gets the to NSC, it. correct. Um, <clears throat> we help Ms. Everybody. Williams, do you have any information that any person who has testified as part of this impeachment uh, inquiry, either in secret or in public, has either perjured themselves or lied to this committee? I have not read the other testimonies. And so you do, not, do you have any evidence, though, that they have perjured themselves or lied? No, because I have not read them. Lieutenant Colonel Vindeman, do you have any evidence that anyone who has testified before this committee in the impeachment inquiry has perjured themselves or lied to this committee? Not that I'm aware of. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Carson. Thank you, Chairman Schiff. I yield to the chairman. I thank the gentleman for yielding. wanted to um, just make one point uh, clear for folks that are watching the hearing today. Bribery does involve a quid pro quo. Uh, bribery involves the conditioning of an official act for something of value. Um, an official act may be a White House meeting. An official act may be $400 million in military aid. And something of value to a president might include investigations of their political rival. The reason we don't ask witnesses that are fact witnesses to make the judgment about whether a crime or bribery has been committed or whether, more significantly, the, what the founders had in mind when they itemized bribery or other high crimes and misdemeanors is your fact witnesses. It will be our job to decide whether the impeachable act of bribery has occurred. Uh, that's why we don't ask you those questions. Um, for one thing, you're also not aware of all the other facts that have been adduced during the investigation. With that, I yield back to Mr. Carson. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you both for your service. Colonel Benman, you were in a July 10th White House meeting in Ambassador Bolton's office. Isn't that right, sir? I'm, I'm sorry, could you say that again? You were in a July 10th White House meeting with Ambassador Bolton. Correct. Uh, in that meeting, the Ukrainians asked about when they would get their Oval Office meeting, and Ambassador Sondland replied that they need to, quote, speak about Ukraine delivering specific investigations in order to secure a meeting with the president, end quote. Is that correct, sir? That is correct. Uh, Colonel Benman, did you later learn why Ambassador Bolton cut the meeting short? I did. After Ambassador Bolton ended that meeting, sir, some of the group that attended a uh, follow-on meeting in a different room in the White House uh, called the Ward Room. Is that correct, sir? That is correct. And Ambassador Sondland was there with the senior Ukrainian officials. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, did NSC lawyers uh, tell you to come directly to them, sir, if you had any other concerns after July 10th? They s said that, um, I believe the words were something to the effect of, if you have any other concerns, feel free to come back. In, in this follow-on meeting, sir, Ambassador Sondman left, in your words, no ambiguity about what specific investigations he was requesting. Uh, Ambassador Sondman made clear that he was requesting an investigation of Vice President Joe Biden's son. Isn't that correct, sir? That is correct. And he stated that he was asking these requests in coordination with Chief of Staff, White House <coughs> Chief of Staff, Mick Mulvaney. Correct, sir? That is what I heard him say. Uh, Colonel, in your career, had you ever before witnessed an American official request that a foreign government investigate a U.S. citizen who is related to the president's political opponent? I have not. Uh, and Colonel, uh, you immediately raised concerns about this, correct, sir? That is correct. Uh, what exactly happened? After I reported it to the, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, you, I'm, I'm sorry, could you say that again? I apologize. You raised concerns about this, correct, sir? Correct. Uh, what happened? To, the, to Ambassador Sondland, if I understood you correctly, I stated that it was inappropriate and had nothing to do with national security policy. Did you also raise concern that, that day with White House lawyers? I did. Uh, what did you tell them? I reported the same thing. that I, I, I reported the content of the conversation with Ambassador Sondland. Uh, at that point, I wasn't aware that uh, Dr. Hill had a, had a conversation uh, with um, Ambassador Bolton, so I just relayed what I had, what what I experienced to to the attorney, lead legal counsel. As we are now aware, sir, uh, Ambassador Bolton expressed his concerns and instructed Dr. Fiona Hill, your supervisor, uh, 
to also meet with the same White House lawyers to tell them what happened. Uh, Colonel Vindman, I agree that there is no question that Ambassador Sondland was proposing a transaction uh, to Ukrainian officials trading White House meetings for specific investigations. With the full awareness of the President's Chief of Staff, White House attorneys, and his National Security Advisor. In my view, sir, that's appalling. Thank you both for your service. I yield back to the Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, I would just point out as well that when the matter does move to the Judiciary Committee and no decision has been made about the ultimate resolution, uh, the White House, uh, through its counsel, will have the opportunity to submit uh, or make a submission to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, I now turn to Dr. Wenstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Lieutenant Colonel Bidman. Thank you very much for being here. As an Army Colonel who served a year in Iraq, I appreciate your service and the sacrifice that you made during that time, and I know the environment. And I understand and appreciate the importance of chain of command. In your deposition, you emphasize the importance of chain of command. You were a direct report to Dr. Fiona Hill and then Mr. Tim Morrison, and they were your seniors, correct? That is correct. When you had concerns about the 725 call between the two presidents, you didn't go to Mr. Morrison about that, did you? I immediately went to John Eisenberg, the lead legal counsel. So that doesn't seem like change of command. But so in the, in the deposition with uh, Mr. I'm sorry, Morrison, that, page 58 to 60, uh, excuse I, me, Chair, please allow Colonel Vindman to answer. Yeah. So I reported it to Do John Eisenberg. I attempted to report it to um, Mr. Morrison. I'd, okay, thank he you. He didn't avail himself, and at that point, I was told not to t uh, suspend Well, he did avail himself, himself, and I'll get into please, that. Please allow the witness to, to finish. Colonel, are you finished with your answer? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. In, your, in the Morrison deposition on page 58 to 60, uh, the question was, do you know if anyone else on the call went to Eisenberg to express concerns? And, your answer, and the answer was, I learned based on today's proceedings, based on open source reporting, which I have no firsthand knowledge that other personnel did raise concerns. Question who? Based on open source, without firsthand knowledge, Alex Vindman on my, on, uh, Alex Vindman on my staff. The question then? And he reports to you, correct? Answer, he does. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman's direct report was Mr. Morrison, and it didn't happen. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, in your deposition, page 96, the question was, okay, after the call on 725, do you have any discussions with Mr. Morrison about your concerns? Answer, after the call, I, well, per the, uh, per the exercise in the chain of command and expressing, I immediately went to the senior NSC legal counsel and shared those concerns. That would be Mr. Eisenberg, correct? I'm sorry, my, my lawyer was talking. Could you say that again, please, doctor? You went to Mr. Eisenberg. You've already said that, so we yes. can go on. And it, you are not a JAG officer. You're not a lawyer. And on page 153 of, of your testimony deposition, in reference to that meeting with Mr. Eisenberg, he said, I was not making a legal judgment. All I was doing is sharing my concerns with my chain of command. Yet we've established that your direct report is to Mr. Morrison. So let's establish your role and your title. In your deposition, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, page 200, 201, in a colloquy with Mr. Stewart, you said, I would say, first of all, I'm the director for Ukraine. I'm responsible for Ukraine. I'm the most knowledgeable. And, and I'm there for the, the National Security Council and, and the White House. Are you the only one of, of the entire universe of our government or otherwise that can advise the president on Ukraine? Couldn't someone like Ms. Williams also advise on Ukraine? It's in her portfolio. That's not typically what would happen. It would be, for, frankly, it would be Ambassador Bolton. That would other, be so other people can advise on Ukraine besides you. Uh, Going on in your testimony, you said, I understand all the nuances, the context, and so forth surrounding these issues. I, on my judgment, went. I expressed concerns within the chain of command, which I think to me, as a military officer, is completely appropriate, and I exercised that chain of command. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, your deposition, page 259, you said, I forwarded my concerns through the chain of command, and the seniors then decide the action to take. Mr. Morrison's your senior. He didn't know about it. How can he decide an action to take? But that's what you said. In Mr. Morrison's deposition, page 60, the question is, at what point did you learn that Lieutenant Colonel Vindman went to Eisenberg? He said, he said, about the 25th phone call? He said, yes, in the course of reviewing for this proceeding, reviewing the open record. 
So the question, next question. So Eisenberg never came to you and relayed to you the conversation? He said, no. He said, Ellis never did either? Not to the best of my recollection. So Mr. Morrison was skipped in your chain of command about your other concerns. So Mr. Morrison said he's the final clearing authority. He said he saw your edits. Do you remember if all of the edits were incorporated? And he said, yes, I accepted all of them. That's on page 61, 62. So he believes all your edits were accepted. Let me ask you, were in your edits, did you insist that the word demand be put into the transcription between the conversation of the two presidents? I did not. But you did? say that in your opening statement today. Thank you, and I yield back. Ms. Beer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you both for your testimony and your service. Uh, Colonel Vindman, <coughs> wasn't it the case that Mr. Eisenberg, the attorney, had said to you after the July 5th meeting that you should come to him if you have any other concerns? Uh, after the July 10th meeting, yes, ma'am, that is correct. And it is not going outside the chain of command to speak to the lawyer within the institution, is that correct? Uh, no, he is um, the senior between the two, certainly. All right, um, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle have um, been complaining about other witnesses having only secondhand information. But in both your cases, you have firsthand information because you were on the July 25th phone call, is that correct? That's correct. That is correct. Now. Uh, Colonel, you in your comments today said, I want to state that the vile character attacks on these distinguished and honorable public servants is reprehensible. Would you like to expand on that at all? Uh, Ma'am, I think they stand on their own. I, I don't think it's necessary to, to expand on it. So in, in both your situations, since you have given depositions, since those depositions have been made public, um, have you seen your uh, experience in your respective jobs uh, changed or have you been treated any differently? I have not, no. Since uh, the report on the uh, July 25th, uh, as I um, uh, stated, I did notice uh, I, I was being excluded from uh, several meetings uh, that would have been appropriate for my position. So in some respects then there have been reprisals. Uh, I'm not sure if I could make that judgment. I could say that uh, it was out of the course of normal affairs to not have me uh, participate in some of these events. Thank you. Uh, in preparation for the July 25th phone call, uh, it's standard for the National Security Council to provide talking points. Is that correct? Correct. Because the words of the president carry incredible weight. Is that not correct? That is correct. So it's important to ensure that everyone has carefully considered the implications of what the president might say to a foreign leader. That is correct. Colonel Vindman, you um, are the National Security Council's director for Ukraine. Did you participate in preparing the talking points for the president's call? I did. I prepared them. You, so you prepared them, they were then reviewed and edited by multiple senior officers at the NSC and the White House, is that correct? That is correct. Did the talking points for the president contain any discussion of investigations into the 2016 election, the Bidens or Burisma? They did not. Are you aware of any written product from the National Security Council suggesting that investigations into the 2016 election, the Bidens, or Burisma are part of the official policy of the United States? No, I'm not. Some of President Trump's allies have suggested that the president requested these investigations for official policy reasons as part of some plan to root out corruption in Ukraine. In your experience, did the official policies of the United States include asking Ukraine to specifically open investigations into the Bidens and interference by Ukraine in the 2016 election? Uh, nothing that we prepared or had discussed uh, up until that point included any of these elements. Would it ever be U.S. policy, in your experience, to ask a foreign leader to open a political investigation? There are proper procedures in which to do that. Uh, certainly the, the president is well within his right to do that. Um, 
It is not something the NSC, certainly a director at the NSC would do. As a matter of fact, we are prohibited from being involved in any transaction between the Department of Justice and a foreign, and a foreign um, power to ensure that there is no perception of manipulation from the White House. So it is not something that we will participate in. Ms. Williams, in your experience, did the official policies of the United States include asking Ukraine to open investigations into the Bidens? I had not seen any reference to those particular cases in our policy formulation process. All right, let me um, just say to you, Lieutenant Colonel Benman, that um, in listening to your opening statement, I um, had chills up and down my spine. Um, and I think most Americans uh, recognize what an extraordinary hero you are uh, to our country. And I would say to your father, um, he did well. I yield back. Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Ms. Williams, Lieutenant Colonel Bidman. Thank both of you for being here today. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Bidman, I see you're wearing your dress uniform. Knowing that's not the uniform of the day, you normally wear a suit to the White House. I think it's a great reminder of your military service. I, too, come from a military family. These are my father's Air Force wings. He was a pilot in World War II. Five of his sons served in the military. So as one military family to another, thank you and your brothers for your service. Your example here. I, I, very quickly, I'm curious, when Ranking Member Nunez referred to you as Mr. Binman, you quickly corrected him and wanted to be called Lieutenant Colonel Binman. Do you always insist on civilians calling you by your rank? Uh, Mr. Stewart, um, Representative Stewart, I'm in uniform wearing my military rank. Uh, I just thought it was appropriate to uh, stick with that. Well, because, I, I, I'm I sorry, Mr. Stewart. No, he, I, I apologize. Meant no because I, I, I don't believe he did, but um, the attacks that I've uh, had in the press um, in, uh, in Twitter have kind of eliminated the fact that either uh, marginalized me as a military officer well, uh, or listen that I just I'm just I'm just telling you that the ranking member net met no disrespect to you I, I believe that I, I'd like to go back to your previous testimony earlier today uh, much as much has been talked about as we've discussed between uh, the President Trump and President Belisky and the word favor and this being interpreted as a basis for impeachment and your interpretation of the word favor, and I'll paraphrase you, and you feel free to correct me, you said, in the military culture, which you and I are both familiar with, when a superior officer asks for a favor of a subordinate, they will interpret that as a demand. Is, is that a fair synopsis of what you previously stated? Uh, Representative, when a superior makes a request, that's an order. Okay, uh, in short, then, you think your interpretation of a favor as a demand is based on your military experience? and the military culture. I think that is correct. I think that is correct. Uh, is President Trump a member of the military? Uh, he is not. Has he ever served in the military? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Is President Zelensky a member of the military? Uh, I the don't believe no. so, I don't know. He's not. It, would it be fair then to take a person who has never served in the military uh, and to take your reevaluation of their words based on your military experience and your military culture, and to attach that culture and that meaning of those words to someone who has never served? Representative, I made that judgment. I stick by that judgment. Okay, well, I got to tell you, I think it's nonsense. I don't, and I'm going to tell you why. Most people look at the position of the president of it being equal to a military commanding officer. That's the reason why the president is the president to the civilian people. But he's the chief and commander to the military people. So even though he's never actually been or isn't a standing officer in the military, he is still equal because of his seat that he sits in. And it's no disrespect to the seat, but the fact of the matter is he holds the elements of life and death in his position in case of a dire emergency towards releasing the nuclear codes 
that could actually end life. So the next question is this, why would you not address someone as the president as being equal to a military officer? That's the $64,000 question. Whenever you're the president of the United States, you're the president to the civilian life, but you're also the chief and commander to the military life, to the military arena. He should know that. Uh, look, I was in the military. I could distinguish between a favor and an order and a demand, and so could my subordinates. And I think President Zelensky did as well. He never initiated an investigation. In fact, he's been very clear. That's your opinion. That's your opinion about that. How do you know how he interpreted that, getting a telephone call from the chief and commander to one of the greatest military forces in the world? How do you know how he interpreted that? Are you in his head? Are you inside his, his body to the point that you know how he interpreted that? No, nor am I. He said, I never felt any pressure at all. So you and naturally he's going to say that because he's not going to jeopardize the, the uh, onslaught of receiving the same type of treatment that his predecessor received before he become president. In other words, he ain't going to bite the hand that's possibly going to feed him. He's not a fool. Naturally, he's he's not gonna say, "Well, the president didn't. The president uh, was pressuring me in some sort of way." Naturally, he's not gonna say that. Why would he say that? He would be jeopardizing his own position towards his own people by possibly disrupting the apple cart. You gotta use a little common sense in some of these scenarios, these uh, hypotheticals that they're talking about here, and you got to be able to read through the questionnaire towards if you was the president of the Ukraine people, the Ukraine uh, government, would had you had agreed? Oh, no, he didn't pressure us. Naturally, he's going to say that. Anybody that holds the position of thousands are, are, I don't know how many people is in the Ukraine. There may be a million or over a million. I don't know. But naturally, whenever you hold the position towards being accountable for all them people's lives, you're going to play the best song and dance that you know to play with somebody that holds the position like Donald Trump. It's kind of like walking into a courthouse and you're in the proceedings of the courtroom and you disrespect the judge because you don't like what he's saying or you don't like how he acted or you don't like uh, uh, how he had dealt with other issues in the past. You know, if you're going to slander a judge, you don't need to do it in his courtroom, because then he can hold you for contempt. Contempt. So if you're a smart person at all, you're going to hold your tongue pertaining to how you feel about that judge until after you get out of his arena. Because while you're in his arena, regardless whether you respect that judge or not, you have to respect the position of that judge, the seat of that judge. And if you don't, there's going to be consequences. The same way with the president over in Ukraine. He knows the position that Donald Trump holds. He's not going to be a fool. He's not going to cut his own nose off to despite his face simply because Donald Trump has basically made this type of request that could be, could be interpreted as a demand because of the 
of the person position that he holds. That's the part that Donald Trump don't understand whenever he gets on the big mic and he says things and he does things. It can be detrimental in people's lives. Just like him holding off on the supplies for 45 days and just like him using his powers or abusing his powers towards trying to gather corruption on his opponent, on his rival. That's the part that Donald Trump don't understand. There are certain things that you just don't say and do, either as a judge or either as a president. And because he done what he done, it falls under the category of whatever category that you want to be, whatever category that you want to be, uh, that you want to put it in towards it either being bribery or blackmail or, or quick pro pro, it fits under the category of being wrong. Now, rather or not that's deemed as being impeachable, rather or not that's deemed as being on the level that they need to remove him from office, I don't know. I'm not the courts. And what the courts will permit and what the courts won't permit is going to be up to them. You know, I never would have thought that Bill Clinton would have remained in power after that they went through the proceedings that they went through towards basically he lied to the American people about I did not have sex with that woman. Knowing good and well that oral sex is still sex. It don't matter if it's oral sex, it's still sex. So, Bill Clinton did lie to the American people. Which, in one incident, fits under the category of being impeachable. But it's up to the interpreter or the committee, the group, of whether or not they're going to pursue that because of that. Interpreted the word favor, but the two people who were speaking to each other did not interpret that as a demand. It was your interpretation. Is that fair? The context of this call, consistent with a July 10th, a July 10th meeting with the reporting that was going on, including the president's personal attorney, made it clear that this was not simply a request. Well, that's not true it, at all. It's not clear at all. You say it makes it clear. It's not clear at all. And the two individuals who were talking to each other didn't interpret it that way. I'd like to go on to discuss your reaction to the phone call and, again, your previous testimony. And for brevity and for clarity, I'm going to refer to your previous testimony, page 155. Your attorney is welcome to follow on. Quoting you, Lieutenant Colonel Bidman, I did not know whether this was a crime or anything of that nature. I thought it was wrong. And I'd like to key on the word wrong here because we're going to come back to that. In my mind, did I consider this factor that could have been other implications? Yes, but it wasn't the basis of, I don't know, lodging a criminal complaint or anything like that. Then you go on to talk about policy concerns and moral and ethical judgments. So your concerns regarding this phone call were not legal. They were based on moral, ethical, and policy differences. Let me ask you then, and you, what you thought were wrong, to use your word. You said this was wrong. Not illegal, but wrong. They was based off of common sense. That's what it was based off of, and it was based off of respect and the positions that certain people hold. Any military engaged personnel, by and large, is supposed to remain neutral in slandering their chief and commander, which is our president, during the time that either they are part of the military force 
or that that particular person is in power towards being the president. It's a respect thing. Because what type of what type of uh, consistencies would we have involving the body, the wholeness of the military, if we was constantly having to be bombarded by hearing people ridiculing their chief and commander, which is our president, if they was to be able to do this at free will. We would have chaos. Total chaos. That's the reason why you are under certain, certain requirements and restrictions as being a military personnel officer in any form or fashion, towards not being able to slander openly your chief and commander. And if doing so, you are substant to the rules of engagement towards being reprimanded for that. That is known throughout every branch of military, it doesn't matter if you're in the Air Force, Army, if you're uh, engaged in, in the Marines, or, or any other branch, that is a known, that is a known to all of the above, just like it's supposed to be known when you walk into a courtroom, there are certain things that are considered orderly, and there are certain things that are considered not orderly. And if you got any sense, whenever you walk in front of a judge, it doesn't matter if you're on trial or your buddy's on trial. There are certain, certain criteria, demands, that goes along with a person standing in front of a person with a black robe. Once you break that criteria, you are substance of being punished by that person wearing that robe if he or she deems it necessary. There are, as I've stated previous sitting here a couple days ago, there are dozens of corrupt nations in the world, hundreds of corrupt government officials exactly one time did a vice president go to a nation and demand the specific firing of one individual and give a six hour time limit and withhold or threaten to withhold a billion dollars in aid if not? It was the one individual who was investigating a company that was paying his son. So I'll ask you, was that also wrong? I, that is not what I understand. I, I frankly don't have any first hand knowledge of that. You have not seen the video? Idea. I've, I've seen the video. I've That's seen all that I've snippet. described is the video. Everything I just said to you was in the video. Was that wrong as well? Congressman, this is something I actually participated well, in. I think the American witnessed. people can make a judgment. That, I don't that know. Too. The, time, the time of the gentleman has expired. Colonel Vindeman, if you'd like to answer the question, you're more welcome. I, I frankly don't know any uh, that much more about that particular incident. I saw the snippet of the video, but I don't know if I can make a judgment off that. Thank you. Um, Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Colonel, it's uh, one thing to ask somebody a favor like, hey, go pick up my dry cleaning. Uh, and it's another when the commander in chief of the most powerful army in the world ask an ally who's in a vulnerable position to do him a favor, is it not? Yes. Let me go back to that military assistance if I could. Uh, Ms. Williams, Again, when did you first learn that the security assistance was being held up, the nearly $400 million that was referenced? July 3rd. And were you aware of any additional or did you attend any additional meetings in which that uh, military assistance being withheld was discussed? I did. I attended meetings on July 23rd and July 26th where the security assistance hold was discussed. I believe it may have also been discussed on July 31st. And uh, at that point, did anyone provide a specific reason for the hold? 
In those meetings, the OMB representative uh, reported that the assistance was being held at the direction of the White House Chief of Staff. And did they give reasons beyond that it was being withheld by the White House Chief of Staff? Not specifically. Uh, the, the reason given was that there was an ongoing review whether the, the funding was still in line with administration priorities. Did anyone in any of those meetings or in any other subsequent uh, discussion you had discuss the legality of withholding that aid? There were discussions, I believe, in the July 31st meeting and possibly prior as well in terms of defense and State Department officials were looking into how they would handle a situation in which earmarked funding from Congress that was designated for Ukraine would be resolved if the funding continued to be held as we approach the end of the fiscal year. And from what you witnessed, did anybody in the national security community support withholding the assistance? No. Colonel, uh, again, just for the record, when did you first learn the security assistance was being withheld? Uh, on or about July 3rd. Uh, and what exactly had you learned from the State Department, I believe, that uh, prompted you to draft the notice on July 3rd? Uh, so on, uh, on or about July 3rd, I became aware of uh, inquiries into um, security assistance funding in general. There are two typical pots, State Department and, and DOD, and uh, I believe it was around that date that OMB put a hold on congressional notification. Had you had any earlier uh, in indications that this might be the case? Um, prior to that, there were, there were some general inquiries on how the funds were being spent, uh, things of that nature, nothing specific, but no, no hold, certainly. Were you aware of anyone in the national security community who supported withholding the aid? No. No one from the national security? None. No one from the State Department? Correct. No one from the Department of Defense? Correct. Did anyone, to uh, your understanding, raise the legality of withholding this assistance? It was raised um, on several occasions. And, and who raised those concerns? Uh, so the following the July 18th um, sub PCC, which is again what I coordinate, or what I convene uh, at my level, there was a July 23rd uh, PCC that would have been conducted by Mr. Morrison. Uh, there, were the, there were questions raised on uh, as to the legality of uh, of the hold. Uh, over the subsequent week, the issue was analyzed, and uh, during the July. Uh, 26th deputies, so the deputies from all the departments and agencies, uh, there was a, a opinion rendered that, that it was uh, it was legal to uh, put, put the hold. It, it was, excuse me? Uh, there was an opinion legal, uh, uh, opinion rendered that it was um, okay to, or that the hold was legal. From a purely legal point of view. Correct. Very good. I yield back to the chairman. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, Ms. Stefanik. Ms. Williams, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, thank you for being here and thank you both for your service. As millions of Americans are watching throughout the hysteria and frenzied media coverage, two key facts have not changed that are critical to these impeachment proceedings. One, Ukraine in fact received the aid, and two, there was no investigation into the Bidens. My question to both of you today will focus on the following. Systemic corruption in Ukraine, two, highlighting for the public that by law, aid to Ukraine requires anti corruption efforts? And three, who in our government has the decision-making authority when it comes to foreign policy and national security matters? So on corruption in Ukraine, as Ambassador Yovanovitch testified, one of the key reasons why President Zelensky was overwhelmingly elected by the Ukrainian people was that they were finally standing up to rampant corruption in their country. Would you both agree with the ambassador's assessment? Yes. Yes. And Ms. Williams, corruption was such a critical issue from your perspective that when you prepared the vice president for his congratulatory call with President Zelensky, you testified that the points you wanted to communicate on the call were the following. Quote, look forward to seeing President Zelensky really implement the agenda on which he had run related to anti-corruption reforms. That's correct. That is, yes. And Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, would you agree that this focus on anti-corruption is a critical aspect of our policy towards Ukraine? I would. 
And Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, you are aware that in 2014, during the Obama administration, the first anti-corruption investigation partnered between the U.S., the U.K., and Ukraine was into the owner of the company Burisma. I, I'm aware of it now. And Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, you testified that you were aware that Burisma had questionable business dealings. That's part of its track record. That is correct. You also testified that regarding Burisma, money laundering, tax evasion comports with your understanding of how business is done in Ukraine. Is that correct? I'm not aware of specific incidents, but I, my understanding is that it would not uh, be out of the out of the realm of the possible for Burisma. Well, that's page 207 from your testimony, but I'll move on. You are aware that Hunter Biden did sit on the board of Burisma at this time. I am. Well, I know, I know that my constituents in New York 21 have many concerns about the fact that Hunter Biden, the son of the vice president, sat on the board of a corrupt company like Burisma. The Obama administration, State Department, was also concerned, and yet Adam Schiff refuses to allow this committee to call Hunter Biden despite our requests. Every witness who has testified and has been asked this has answered yes. Do you agree that Hunter Biden on the board of Burisma has the potential for the appearance of a conflict of interest? Certainly the potential, yes. And Ms. Williams? Yes. Now, shifting to the legal requirements that our aid to Ukraine is conditioned on anti-corruption, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, you testify that you understood that Congress had passed, under the Ukrainian Security Assistance Initiative, a legal obligation to certify that corruption is being addressed. That is correct. And you also testify that it is required by the National Defense Authorization Act. That is correct. So for the public listening, we are not just talking about President Trump focusing on anti-corruption in Ukraine, but it is so critical, so important that hard-earned taxpayer dollars when given to foreign nations that by law, overwhelmingly bipartisan support requires anti-corruption in Ukraine in order to get U.S. taxpayer-funded aid. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, you spoke extensively about the importance of defensive lethal aid to Ukraine, specifically javelins. This was in your deposition. Correct. And you testified that the javelin in particular, because of its effectiveness in terms of influencing the Russian decision calculus for aggression, it is one of the most important tools we had, have when it comes to providing defensive lethal aid. The system itself and the signaling of U.S. support, yes. And it is a fact that that aid was provided under President Trump and not President Obama. That is correct. And my last question, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, I know you serve at the NSC in the White House. I served in the West Wing of the White House for President Bush on the Domestic Policy Council and in the Chief of Staff's office, so I'm very familiar with the policy process. I also know that as a staff member, the person who sets the policy in the United States is the president, not the staff. And you testified that the president sets the policy, correct? That is correct. And I respect your deep expertise, your tremendous service to our country. We can never repay those that have worn the military uniform and served our nation. But I was struck when you testified in your deposition. I would say, first of all, I'm the director for Ukraine. I'm responsible for Ukraine. I'm the most knowledgeable. I'm the authority for Ukraine, for the National Security Council and the White House. I just want a clarification. You report to Tim Morrison, correct? In my advisory report is Tim Morrison. Yeah, in correct? my advisor, just to, to clarify, in my only in my advisory capacity, I advise up through the chain of command. That's what I do. And the chain of command is Tim Morrison to Ambassador uh, John Bolton, the National Security Advisor to the President of the United States. Mm -hmm. And do you agree that the President sets the policy as Commander in Chief, as you testified previously? Absolutely. Thank you. My time's expired. Mr. Swallow. Thank you both. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, I think the follow-up question that my colleague from New York did not ask you but is relevant for everyone at home, isn't it true that the Department of Defense had certified that the anti-corruption requirements of Ukraine had been met when the hold was put on by the President? That is correct. Now, Mr. Jordan suggested that the President did something none of us expected by releasing that call transcript. You listened to the call, is that right, Lieutenant Colonel? That is. Ms. Williams, you also listened to the call, is that right? Yes. Fair to say, Ms. Williams, a lot of other people at the White House listened to the call or read the transcript? I can't characterize how many. I believe there were four, four five or six of us in the, the listening room at the time. And the transcript was distributed to others, is that right? I wasn't part of that process, but that's my understanding. So the president is asking for us and his defenders to give him a gold star because a number of people listened to the call or saw the call transcript 
and then he released it. The difference, of course, between this and, say, his one-on-one -on -one -on meeting in Helsinki with Vladimir Putin was there, it was a one-on-one -on -one meeting, and he took the notes from the interpreter so none of us could see it. The point being, the president had no choice but to release a call that everyone had seen. Now, you've been asked to also characterize what exactly legally all of this means. And Mr. Ratcliffe pointed out that no one had used the term bribery uh, in our depositions. And Ms. Williams, you're not a lawyer, are you? I'm not, no. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, are you a lawyer? Lawyer's back there. The lawyer's your brother, right? No. Born 20 seconds after you, is that what you said? Nine minutes. Nine minutes after you, yes. <laughs> you're the older brother. Yeah. Lifetime of wisdom there. Now, I want to give you a, a hypothetical here. Suppose you have a shooting victim and the police respond after the victim uh, is doing a little bit better and they ask the victim, well, tell us what happened. And the victim says, well, someone came up to my car, shot into the car, hit me in the shoulder, hit me in the back, hit me in the neck. Miraculously, I survived, but I can identify you know, who the person is that uh, pulled the trigger. And the police say, okay, you were shot. You know who it is, but shucks, you didn't tell us that this was an attempted murder, so we're going to have to let the person go. Is that how it works in our justice system, that unless victims or witnesses identify the legal theories of a case, we just let people off the hook? Is that how it works, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman? I'm not an attorney, but it doesn't seem so. I don't think your brother would think so uh, either. Ms. Williams, Vice President Pence was described to our committee by Mr. Morrison as a, quote, voracious reader of his intelligence read book. And after the April 21 call with President Zelensky, you put a transcript of that call in the Vice President's read book. Is that right? That's correct. And then the Vice President called President Zelensky two days later. Is that right? That's correct. And you told us in the deposition that he stuck pretty faithfully to what President Trump had said in that April 21 call. Is that right? I believe his remarks were consistent, but he also spoke on other issues as well, including anti-corruption. And you would describe the, pre the vice president as somebody who would make follow-up calls to world leaders after the president had done so. Is that right? He has on occasion. It's not a normal practice. It depends on the situation. And in that case, he stuck to President Trump's talking points. I would say that I provided talking points for the April 23rd call for the vice president, which included discussion of the, uh, President Zelensky's inauguration, which President Trump had also discussed with President Zelensky. But I would say the vice president discussed other issues with President Zelensky as well. And as was stated earlier, the president sets the foreign policy for the United States. Is that right? Absolutely. And you told us that after the July 25 call between President Trump and President Zelensky, that you put the call transcript in Vice President Pence's intelligence briefing book. Is that right? I ensured it was there. My colleagues prepared the book, but yes. So let's flash forward to September 1. Vice President Pence meets with President Zelensky. Is that right? That's correct. You're there. Yes. And President Zelensky with Vice President Pence, they talk about a lot of things, but you will agree that Vice President Pence did not bring up the Bidens. Is that correct? That's correct. He did not. He did not bring up investigations? No. Is one reasonable explanation that although Vice President Pence will do a lot of things for President Trump, that he was not willing to bring up investigations in Biden's because he thought it was wrong? I'm not in a position to speculate. We had not discussed those particular investigations in any of the preparatory sessions with the Vice President. But you didn't not... bring it up with the Ukrainians after the July 25 call, right? He did not in that meeting, no. And you did not either? No. And Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, did you ever ask the Ukrainians to do what President Trump was asking them to do after the July 25 phone call? I, I did not. I didn't render any opinion on uh, what was asked uh, in the 25. Thank you. Yield back. Mr. Hurd. Ms. Williams, um, I want to join my colleagues in thanking you for your service. Uh, we share a personal hero in Dr. Rice, so great minds think alike. Um, did you participate in or overhear any conversations about how potential information collected from the Ukrainians on the Bidens would be used for political gain? No, I did not participate or overhear any conversations along those lines. Thank you. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, um, I think all of us would agree that uh, your father made the right move uh, to come here, and we're glad um, that, that he did. 
Um, you've talked about how part of your responsibilities is developing talking points for your principals. Is that correct? That is correct. President, I'm assuming you also do that for your direct supervisor currently right now, Mr. Morrison. Is that correct? Uh, um, Mr. Morrison has uh, left the position uh, some time ago already, at least three weeks ago. So, so but you do the, you pr prepare talking points for your supervisors. Is that correct? Uh, Typically, uh, frankly, the, at, at that level, they don't really take talking points, um, especially if they have expertise. The talking points are more intended for National Security Advisor, although uh, Ambassador Bolton didn't re really require him to because of his deep expertise. It's sure. the next level up, the president. But traditionally, I'm just trying to establish that this position is somebody that accurate, creates sorry. talking points for a number of people. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Do they always use them? No. Or is, is President Trump known to stick to a script? I, um, I don't believe so. So is it odd that he didn't use your talking points? No, it is not. In your deposition, if your lawyer wants to follow on, um, it's page 306. Um, you were asked about events during the temporary holds on U.S. assistance to, to Ukraine. This is that 55-day period or so. And you testified that the U.S. administration did not receive any new assurances from Ukraine about anti-corruption efforts and that the facts on the ground did not change before the hold was lifted. Is that, is that accurate in recounting your testimony? That is accurate. When was President Zelensky sworn in? Uh, he was sworn in on, excuse me, May 20th, uh, 2019. And then he had a new parliament, too, elected after he was. Is that correct? He did. And when was that parliament seated? That was, um, that was I'm sorry, July 21st, 2019. Um, they, they, that was when they won, right? They, they weren't properly seated until August. Is that That's right. That's when right? they won and they weren't seated until August. Your boss's boss, um, Ambassador Bolton, traveled to Ukraine in late August, right? August 27, 28, is that correct? That is correct. Did he take you with you? Did he I, take you he with him? He didn't. Um, we know from other witnesses that when Ambassador Bolton was there, he met with President Zelensky and his staff, and they talked about how they were visually exhausted because one of the things that President Zelensky did during that time period was change the Ukrainian constitution to remove absolute immunity from RADA deputies, right? They're some of their parliamentarians, um, because that had been the source of raw corruption for, for a number of years. Is that accurate? That is accurate. Were you, were you aware of this important change to Ukrainian law? Of course. Yep. Um, and you don't believe that's a significant anti-corruption effort? No, it is It is significant. It's pretty significant, correct. Um, also, Ambassador Taylor testified that um, President Zelensky, Zelensky, with this new parliament, um, opened Ukraine's high anti-corruption court. Right? This had been an initiative that many folks and the U and our State Department had been, had been um, pushing to happen, and that was established um, in that time frame. It, it, were you aware of this? Yes. Do you think this is a significant anti-corruption? I do. Um, when you talked about, um, you, how many times have you met President Zelensky? I think it was just the one time from the uh, presidential delegation. Uh, multiple engagements, but just the one trip. And that's a one-on-one -on -one meeting? Uh, that was in a bilateral, larger bilateral format. Um, then there, was, there were a couple of smaller venues. They were all in... Uh, there was never a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, but there were a couple of, again, uh, again, touch points. So the bilateral meeting, handshake, meet and greet, uh, sure. you had a short... So there was a lot of people in the room yeah. when, when you yes. met with them. That's but you still advise the Ukrainian president to watch out for the Russians? Yes. And that was... That was and that... And, Everybody else in the room, I'm assuming um, the national security advisor was there, I believe. In this case, um, you had other members of the administration. Was that, um, were your points pre-approved? Did they know you were going to bring up those points? I, we did have a huddle beforehand, and it's possible I flagged them, but I don't, I don't recall specifically. It's possible that they, um, I didn't. And you counseled the Ukrainian president to stay out of U.S. politics? Correct. Um, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the time I do not have. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Castro. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Ms. Williams, thank you for your service to the country. Uh, Colonel Binman, thank you for your, for your service. And it's great to talk to a fellow identical twin. I hope that your brother's nicer to you than mine is to me. <laughs> it doesn't make you grow a beard. Uh, you both listened in real time to the July 25th call. 
In particular, you would have heard President Trump ask the president of Ukraine, quote, I'd like you to find out what happened with this whole situation with Ukraine. They say CrowdStrike. And quote, the server, they say Ukraine has it. This is a debunked conspiracy theory that has no basis in fact. President Trump's own former Homeland Security Advisor, Thomas P. Bosser, called the president's assertion that Ukraine intervened in the 2016 elections, quote, not only a conspiracy theory, but, quote, unquote, completely debunked, unquote. Colonel Vindman, are you aware of any evidence to support the theory that the Ukrainian government interfered in the 2016 election? Congressman, I'm not. And I'm, uh, furthermore, I would say that this is a Russian narrative uh, that President Putin has promoted. And are you aware of any part of the U.S. government, uh, its foreign policy or intelligence apparatus that supports that theory? No, I'm not aware of. And you are aware that other parts of the U.S. government, our intelligence community, for example, has said definitively that it was the Russians who interfered in the 2016 elections. That is correct. It, it seems incredibly odd, though, unfortunately, but not inconsistent to me, that President Trump would be giving, be, be giving credence to a conspiracy theory about Ukraine that helps Russia really in at least two ways. First, it ignores and frankly undermines the assessment of the U.S. intelligence community and seeks to weaken a state dependent on the United States support to fight Russian aggression. It also, for the United States, hurts our, hurts our national security and emboldens Russia. And I want to look at what President Trump was doing on his call instead of pushing back against Russian hostility. He was pressuring Ukraine to do his political work. President Trump stated on that, on that July 25th call, quote, there's a lot of talk about Biden's son, that Biden stopped the prosecution, and a lot of people want to find out about that, so whatever you can do with the Attorney General would be great. Biden went around bragging that he stopped the prosecution, so if you can look into it, it sounds horrible to me. Colonel Vindman, when you hear those words, do you hear the President requesting a thoughtful and well-calibrated anti-corruption program consistent with U.S. policy? I do not. In fact, it sounds like President Trump was encouraging the Ukrainian president to engage in precisely the same type of behavior for President Trump's own political benefit that we discourage foreign leaders from undertaking in their own countries. And discouraging other countries from undertaking politically motivated investigation is in fact a major part of official U.S. anti-corruption policy. Is that correct? That is correct. And are you in fact aware of any evidence that Vice President Biden improperly interfered in investigation of his family members? I am not. These false narratives, it should be said, are damaging our country. They poison our politics and distract from the truth. And pressing another country to engage in corruption is antithetical to who we are as a nation. You also mentioned that this request, well, you felt this request was wrong. And you've also said that corruption in Ukraine is endemic to Ukraine, just as it is in other places around the world. What is the, can you speak to, what is the danger of a, a president of the United States, whether it's Donald Trump or any future president, asking another nation where there's rampant corruption to investigate a political rival or just any other American citizen? What would be the danger to that American? Uh, Congressman, um, the, Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainian uh, judiciary is imperfect at the moment. And the, the reliance on U.S. support could conceivably cause them to tip the scales of justice in favor of finding uh, a, a, a U.S. citizen guilty if they thought they needed to do that international. So they could trump up charges if they wanted to in a corrupt system like that. They could, and Ukraine is making progress, certainly uh, more broadly in Russia, that is likely to happen, where the state will be involved in, ju in uh, judicial outcomes and drive them. Thank you. I yield back, Chairman. Mr. Ratcliffe. Thank you, Chairman. Ms. Williams. You testified that what you noted as being unusual 
about the call that uh, took place on July 25th was that the president raised what appeared to be a domestic political issue, correct? Correct. But raising an issue, even one that you thought was unusual, is different than making a demand. Would you agree? Yes. And uh, as I read your deposition, it didn't sound like uh, from your testimony that you heard what took place on that call as a demand for investigations. Is that fair? I don't believe I'm in a position to characterize it further than the president did in terms of asking for a favor. You didn't hear a demand. Again, I would just refer back to the transcript itself. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, you've testified um, and explained to us why in your mind it was a demand. And you've given us reasons, a disparity of power between the two presidents. Uh, and because you did feel that way, you also felt that you had a duty to report what you thought was improper. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So two different people, two impartial observers, one felt the need to report the call because there was a demand that was improper and one that didn't report it to anyone. You didn't report it to anyone, right, Ms. Williams? I ensured that the information was available to my superiors. So while all this might seem as clear as mud, I think your honest and candid assessments of what you heard on the call tells us what we need to know. We have two independent folks, nonpartisans, and I'm not hearing a consensus between the two of you about what exactly you both heard on the call that you heard at the exact same time. And if you can't reach an agreement with regard to what happened on the call, how can any of us? An impeachment inquiry is supposed to be clear. It's supposed to be obvious. It's supposed to be overwhelming and compelling. And if two people on the call disagree honestly about whether or not there was a demand and whether or not anything should be reported on a call, that is not a clear and compelling basis to undo 63 million votes and remove a president from office. I yield my remaining time to Mr. Jordan. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, Colonel Vindman, um, why didn't you go after the call? Why didn't you go to uh, Mr. Morrison? I went immediately per the, uh, per the instructions from the July 10th uh, incident. I met, went immediately to um, Mr. Eisenberg. After that, once I made that, uh, my, uh, expressed my concerns, it was an extremely busy week. We had a, a PCC just finish. We had the call and then we had a deputies meeting, which consumed all of my time. I was working extremely long days. I attempted to try to communicate. To, I, I, I managed to speak to two folks in the interagency. I attempted to try to talk to Mr. Morrison. That didn't happen before I received instructions from uh, John Eisenberg to not talk to anybody else any further. So the lawyer, you not only didn't go to your boss, you said you tried, but you didn't go to your boss. You went straight to the lawyer and the lawyer told you not to go to your boss? He, no, he didn't tell me until, uh, uh, what ended up unfolding is I had the conversation with the attorney. I did my coordination, my core function, which is coordination. I spoke to the appropriate people within the interagency and then circling back around, Mr. Eisenberg came back to me and told me not to talk to anyone well, I'm gonna read from the transcript here. Why didn't you go to your direct report, Mr. Morrison? Your response was, this page 102, because Mr. Eisenberg had told me to take my concerns to him. Then I asked you, did, did Mr. Eisenberg tell you not to report, to go around Mr. Morrison? And you said, actually he did say that, I shouldn't talk to any other people. Is that right? Yes, but there's a whole, there's a, a period of time in there between when I spoke to him and when he circled back around. It wasn't that long a period of time, but it was enough time for me to... Enough time to go to talk to someone that you won't tell us who it is, right? I, I, I've been instructed not to, um, Representative Jordan. Well, here's what I'm getting. The lawyer told you don't talk to any other people, and you interpret that as not talking to your boss, but... You talk to your brother, you talk to the lawyers, you talk to Secretary Kent, and you talk to the one guy Adam Schiff won't tell you, won't let us, uh, won't let you tell uh, us who he is. Is that right? Representative Jordan, I did my job. I'm not saying you did it. All I'm saying is you and your the instructions from a law, the lawyer was you shouldn't talk to anybody, and you interpret that as don't talk to my boss, but I'm going to go talk to someone that we can't even ask you who that individual is. That is incorrect. 
Well, I just read what you said. That is I shouldn't incorrect. talk to any other Honorable people. The gentleman has expired. Yeah, there's, I'm sorry, Chairman, but yes, that sequence is not the way it played out. I'm I reading from the attorney. transcript, Colonel Vindman. The, Jordan, please let Colonel Vindman. Yeah, there, there's the sequence played out where immediately afterwards I expressed my concerns. I did my coordination function. Mr. Eisenberg circled back around, told me not to talk to anybody else. In that period of time, I did not oh, manage so to Oh, so that's when it happened. Mr. That's Heck, when you, you talked to someone. Mr. Heck? That's right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Colonel Lindman, let's go back to that <clears throat> pair of meetings on July 10th in Ambassador Bolton's office and down in the boardroom where you witnessed Ambassador Sondland inform the Ukrainian officials that as a prerequisite to a White House meeting between the two presidents, quote, the Ukrainians would have to deliver an investigation into the Bidens, end quote. You said that Ambassador Sondland was, quote, calling for an investigation that didn't exist into the Bidens and Burisma. Is that correct? That is correct. It's that same afternoon you went to Mr. Eisenberg, the council, correct? Uh, that meeting occurred in the afternoon and within, you know, a couple hours, I'm sure it was within a couple hours I spoke to Mr. Eisenberg. How did he react? Uh, he was cool, calm, and collected. He took notes and he said he would look into it. And did he not also tell you to feel free to come back if he did. you had additional concerns? He did, Congressman. Ambassador Sondland had told you that his request to the Ukrainians had been coordinated with the Chief of Staff, Acting Chief of Staff, Mick Mulvaney. Did you report that to Mr. Eisenberg? I did. And what was his reaction? Uh, he, he took notes and he said he was gonna, he'll um, follow up or look into it. I don't recall exactly what he said. Colonel, you've also testified that on the July 25th call now between the two presidents, quote, there was no doubt, end quote, that President Trump asked for investigations into the 2016 election and Vice President Biden's son in return for a White House meeting. Within an hour of that call, you reported that to Mr. Eisenberg, did you not? I did. Went back to him just as he had suggested would be appropriate? Uh, he's an assistant to the president. He, it was less a suggestion, more, than, uh, more of an instruction. Did you tell the lawyers that President Trump asked President Zelensky to speak to Mr. Giuliani? Yes. And the lawyers, it was at this point, told you not to talk to anyone else? Uh, that, that, is, uh, that's, that is not a correct with regards to timing. They didn't follow back, uh, they didn't um, circle back around. What ended up happening is, in my coordination role, I spoke to st state, I spoke to a member of the intelligence community, and the general counsel from one of the, of the intelligence bodies notified Mr. Eisenberg, that there was um, you know, that there was uh, information on the call, on the July 25th call. At that point, Mr. Eisenberg told me I shouldn't talk to anybody else about it. Colonel, I want to go back to 2014 in Iraq when you were blown up. I presume that given the point in your military career and what else was going on in the world, that upon recovery there was the very real prospect or possibility that you might once again find yourself in harm's way. Is that correct? Uh, yes, uh, Congressman, it happened in 2004, I guess. Four, excuse me, thank you. Did you consider leaving the military service at that point? Uh, no, um, frankly, Congressman, I suffered uh, light wounds. I was fortunate compared to my counterparts in the, in the same vehicle, and I returned to duty uh, as I think, I think it may have been that same day. But you could have been subjected to additional harm. You chose to continue service in uniform. I continued to serve in combat for the remaining 10 or 11 months of the tour. You know, Colonel, I have to say, I find it a rich but incredibly painful irony that within a week of the president, contrary to all uh, advice of his senior military officials, he pardons those who were convicted of war crimes, which was widely decried in the military community. Within the week of him doing that, he is engaged in an effort and allies on his behalf, including some here today, to demean your record of service and the sacrifice and the contribution you have made. Indeed, sir, less than 20 minutes ago, the White House officially quoted out, out of context, the comments referred to earlier by Mr. Morrison in your judgment. 
I can only conclude, sir, that what we thought was just the president as the subject of our deliberations in this inquiry isn't sufficient to capture what's happening here. Indeed, what's subject to this inquiry and what is at peril is our Constitution and the very values upon which it is based. I want to say thank you for your service, but you know, thank you doesn't cut it. Please know, however, that it comes from the bottom of my heart, and I know on the bottoms of the heart of countless other Americans. Thank you for your service, sir. I yield back. Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sunday, Sunday, the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives called the President of the United States an imposter. Speaker of the House called the President an imposter. The guy 63 million people voted for, the guy who won an electoral college landslide, the Speaker calls an imposter. That's what's happened to our country, to this Congress. The Speaker's statement says it all. The Democrats have never accepted the will of the American people. Democrats don't trust the American people. The American people who wanted to send someone to this town who was willing to shake it up a bit, they don't trust that. And they have tried to do everything they can to undo what the American people decided on November 8th, 2016. They've been out to get the president since the day he was elected. The whistleblower's lawyer, the whistleblower's legal team said this, January 30th, 2017, the president been in office about a week. Coup has started, first of many steps. Next sentence, impeachment will follow ultimately. I guess we're in the final step. Started, started three and a half years ago. Congressman Tlaib started this Congress. First day of Congress said, impeach the president. Representative Green said, if we don't impeach him, the president's gonna win re-election. We gotta do it. Most importantly, most importantly, five Democrat members of this committee voted to move forward with impeachment before the phone call ever happened. The truth is, the attacks actually started before, before the inauguration, even before the election. The ranking member talked about this, in his opening statement, July 2016. FBI opens an investigation, so-called Trump Russia coordination collusion, which was never there. Open an investigation spied on two American citizens associated with the presidential campaign. My guess is that's probably never happened in American history, but they did it. And for 10 months, Jim Comey's FBI investigated the president. Guess what? After 10 months, they had nothing. And you know why we know that? Because when we deposed Mr. Comey last Congress, he told us they didn't have a thing. No matter. Special Counsel Mueller gets appointed. And they do a two-year, $40 million, 19-lawyer, unbelievable investigation. And guess what? They come back, and they got nothing. But the Democrats don't care. So now we get this. Bunch of depositions in the bunker in the basement of the Capitol. Witnesses who aren't allowed to answer questions about who they talk to about the phone call. We get this. All based on some anonymous whistleblower no firsthand knowledge, bias against the president. These facts have never changed. We learned these right away. Who worked with Vice President Biden, who wrote a memo the day after somebody talked to him about the call, but waited 18 days to file a complaint. 18 days to file a complaint. What did he do in those 18 days? We all know. Ran off and talked with Chairman Schiff's staff. And then hired, hired the legal team that I just talked about that I just talked about, one of the steps in the whole impeachment coup, as his legal team has said. This is scary what these guys are putting our country through. It is, it is, it is sad, it is scary, it is wrong. And the good news is, the American people see through it all. They know the facts are on the president's side. As Representative Stefanik said, four facts will never change. We got the transcript, which they never thought the president would release. 
Shows no coordination, no conditionality, no linkage. We got the two guys on the call, President Trump, President Zelensky, who have said nothing wrong, no pressure, no pushing here. We got the fact the Ukrainians didn't even know aid was held up at the time of the call. And most importantly, we have yet to have one witness tell us that the any any evidence from anyone that, that President Zelensky did anything on investigations to get the aid released. Those facts will never change. The facts are on the president's side. The process is certainly not. It has been the most unfair process we have ever seen, and the American people understand it. Those 63 million Americans, they understand it, and frankly, I think a lot of others do as well. They see what this, is, this for what it is, and they know this is wrong, especially wrong, just 11 months before the next election. I yield back. Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you. What this hearing is about, I think, was best stated by Colonel Vindman's opening statement. The question before us is this, is it improper for the President of the United States to demand a foreign government investigate a United States citizen and political opponent? Right. Very well stated. I just listened to Mr. Jordan, as you did as well, and I heard his criticisms of the process Nothing really happened. A lot of people are out to get the president. I didn't hear an answer to the question as to whether it's proper for the president of the United States to demand a foreign government to investigate a U.S. citizen and political opponent. And to date, I haven't heard any one of my Republican colleagues address that question. Colonel Vindman and Ms. Williams, thank you. I want to ask some questions that go through the background. What's come out during this process is that we had two Ukraine policies. One was bipartisan and longstanding, and that was to assist Ukraine, which had freedom, it freed itself from the domination of Russia, to fight corruption and to resist Russian aggression. Is that a fair statement? Colonel Vindman? I think that's a fair characterization, Congressman. And to give folks a reminder of the extent of corrupt corruption, by the way, a legacy of Putin's Ru Russia, is it your understanding that when their prior uh, pr uh, president, Mr. Yanukovych, fled to Russia into the arms of Mr. Putin, he took with him 30 to 40 billion dollars of that impoverished country? Those, uh, there are different estimates, but it's on that scale, yes. Vast scale for a poor country. And is it your understanding that powerless but motivated Ukrainians rose up in protest to this incredible graft and theft and abuse by their president? That is correct. And that was in the Maiden, it was called the Maiden Revolution, the Revolution of Dignity, correct? Correct. And young people went into that square in downtown Kyiv and demonstrated for months, correct? Correct. And 100 died. 106 young people died and older people died, correct? That was in, 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 in uh, between February 18, 2014 and February 22. Is that correct? Correct. 106 died including people who were shot by snipers, kids. And Yanukovych had put snipers on the rooftops of buildings to shoot into that square and kill, murder, slaughter those young people. Is that your understanding? That is correct. In our bipartisan support, and by the way, I want to say to my Republican colleagues, a lot of leadership to have this bipartisan support came from your side. Thank you. But our whole commitment was to get rid of corruption and to stop that Russian aggression. Is that correct? That amounts to some of the key pillars. That's right. And the Giuliani, Sondman, and it appears Trump policy was not about that. It was about investigations into a political opponent, correct? I'll take that question back, we know it. And you know, I'll say this to President Trump. 
You want to investigate Joe Biden? You want to investigate Hunter Biden? Go at it. Do it. Do it hard. Do it dirty. Do it the way you do do it. Just don't do it by asking a foreign leader to help you in your campaign. That's your job. It's not his. Right. My goal in these hearings is two things. One is to get an answer to Colonel Vindman's question. And the second coming out of this is for us as a Congress to return to the Ukraine policy that Nancy Pelosi and Kevin McCarthy both support. It's not investigations. It's the restoration of democracy in Ukraine and the resistance of Russian aggression. I yield back. Right. Which leads me to a $64,000 question. And I have brought this out before to various people, and it basically just goes in one ear and out the other. Out of all the countries, out of all the places, out of all the hidden valleys and tunnels, and underground movements that has occurred and is occurring up onto this planet. How come Eric Snowden left America and went to Russia? He could have went to Mexico. He could have went to South America. He could have went to the Holy Land. He could have went to Canada. He could have went to Hong Kong. He could have went to New Zealand or Australia or Ireland or any other country, including Africa. How come he, Eric Snowden, that worked for these type of government officials, communications, how come he wound up going to Russia? He didn't go to the Ukrainians. He went to the Russians. So what's up with people going to Russia or seeking asylum in Russia or trying to partner up with Russia which was the very thing that Ronald Reagan contradicted whenever he told Brezhnev and Gorbachev, I think Brezhnev was still living at the time, he may not have been in power, told them that what that they was doing was evil. He demonized that group of people over there and basically ordered for... Gorbachev to come to the gate, come to the come to the, the doorway, come to the 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 beginning part of all this, and to tear down that wall, which was now thirty years in the making, that this is the result that we're seeing from all this. How come Our president felt obliged while running for his position that he now currently holds. Felt comfortable in making a gesture or a statement in the regards towards saying, Russia, if you're listening, you can now pull up And if you have Hillary Clinton's emails, expose them to the world. Expose them to the world. I believe is what he had to say about Russia. Russia has not been playing by the rules. Russia has been giving bombs and other types of 
doomsday devices to various people over in the Middle East. President Putin thinks that his old KGB USSR government has not been defeated in not only morals but also been defeated pertaining to our practices that our founders, our builders, our ancestors indoctrinated into our Constitution so that there would be free, fair, open elections. So that people wouldn't have to worry about being controlled like a bunch of robots or like a bunch of puppets. Like they're basically standing up against and opposing over in China right now even as I speak. Even as I speak. There are people losing arms, legs, eyes, and even lives towards those people waking up to that same type of tyranny that has dominated that society over there, which I think is over a billion people. Over a billion. Something like a billion and a half. More people over there than it is over here that are finally awakening because of the Internet, because of certain Facebook... You two Twitter platforms out there, social media platforms, they're finally waking up to the extent of saying enough is enough and that we would rather die than to be ruled under this type of tyranny. The very same thing that our ancestors stood up against pertaining to King George the Third, I think he was, that said we would rather die than to be ruled this way. By a king over in Europe or over in that area, England or wherever it was. Instead of our democracy moving forward since we have allowed or the people has elected Donald Trump into power, it is giving the appearances of one step forward and two steps back. And may God have mercy on all of us if we are not smart enough to identify these hidden legendas, these hidden incentives that for some strange reason various people thinks that they can harbor or foster up under the wing of President Putin. That's what's on trial here. What's on trial here is our ethics of who we are, what we believe in, and what not only have we sacrificed for, but what we're willing to sacrifice for if deems necessary again. And may we be called on the carpet by creating malice in regard towards contradictory what our ancestors who founded this great country over here, may we be called upon to the red carpet if we contradict that original ideal or that original dream or that original vision that all men are mankind, men and women are created equal. And we have the right to pursue happiness under certain statutes, under certain guidelines pertaining to our Constitution, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, etc., 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 all based around 
all based around our rights. I personally believe that the individual that you're looking at right here to the right of the screen should be looked upon in a very, very heroic form. Because he knew that withholding that aid at that particular time with one of our partners, with one of our allies that was going through what they was going through pertaining to blood and guts over there, pertaining to the Russians against the people of Ukraine and vice versa. I think the individual to the right of the screen should be looked upon as being noble and in a heroic form towards going beyond the call of duty in raising a red flag in regards to the whistleblower that originally blowed the whistle to begin with towards saying something, something isn't right here. Something is going on here. And of course it wasn't until after, after, the whistleblower brought it to the Congress that within a 48-hour period the precious commodities, and I call them commodities, I realize commodities is supposed to be food, but to me you can have more than just food commodities, in which I'm sure there was probably some, uh, some, some food uh, involved in uh, that type of, of uh, package, uh, you know, you always got those packages of food that that, uh, that the soldiers can eat out in the field, and some of that stuff actually tastes pretty good, especially if you're hungry, you hadn't ate nothing else and you've been adjusted to it, but uh, these type of assets, military assets, was, re was restrained for no good justifiable reason and on top of that and on top of that for a president to ask a favor which as I was speaking of a while ago could be interpreted as a demand because of the position that he holds towards scraping up as much dirt as you can on his rivals, on his opponent, which would have been on the Democrat Party side. Now, if you can't see through that, if you can't comprehend that, if you can't understand that, then somebody needs to take you back to the jigsaw puzzle pertaining to the fundamental basis of what common sense is supposed to stand for to begin with. Once more, if it looks like a duck, sounds like a duck, walks like a duck, odds are it's a duck. It ain't going to be an eagle. It ain't going to be a chicken. It ain't going to be a pheasant. It ain't going to be a peacock. It ain't going to be some other exotic bird. It's going to be a duck. You can try to dress him up all you want. Towards putting lipstick on a pig. But after it's all said and done with, it's kind of hard to make a silk purse out of a pig's ear. I personally think that our president has done something not only morally wrong, but legally wrong and ethnically wrong that he should be held accountable for his actions. Now, naturally, his party, the Republican Party, are going to stand up and they're going to use this angle, they're going to use that angle. They're going to use this tactic, just like the guy bringing up all the paperwork, bringing in 
all the paperwork. I was beginning to wonder if I wasn't watching the Santa Claus movie. Remember the Santa Claus movie? Whenever the courts was going up against Kris Kringle, and they had they brought in all them packages of letters of children that was writing to Santa Claus to the North Pole towards wanting a present, wanting a toy. I was beginning to wonder if this guy wasn't going to just have leaps and bounds of stacks and stacks and stacks of, of paperwork. Similar towards what went on in the movie, the Santa Claus movie. I don't I forgot the name of the movie now, but I thought it was kind of cute whenever I first seen it pertaining to Kris Kringle. But let's not deviate from, once more, the facts. The facts is that Donald Trump had the power in his own hand, in his own, in his own pen. What is the old saying? That the pen is more mightier than the sword? Well, in this incident, it was. He not only called down an American ambassador towards telling her that she needs to get on the next airplane now. Not proper preparations towards next week or next month, but now. Basically indicating some sort of a, a dire threat was going to happen to the woman if she didn't get on the plane immediately. To hold back that type of aid that the Ukrainian people needed to fight the aggression coming from the Russians. As the Speaker of the House had said, all roads lead back to Putin. Why? Why is this happening to our President? Why did Eric Snowden go to Russia versus another country? What is it with the Russians that people are wanting to be sympathetic towards. The next thing you know, we'll have people in our own White House working that'll be sympathetic against ISIS. ISIS. The Jihad. The Taliban. Known terrorist that has tried and has succeeded in killing the Americans. The next thing you know, we'll have them in the White House working if we don't watch. Which I know that sounds extreme, but it's true. We have to draw a line in the sand somewhere and say enough is enough. Pertaining to be a Russian sympathizer based around the Russians' practices for the past four or five years. At first, the old USSR was acting halfway obedient to the alliances and to the European Union agreement and the um, Atlantic alliances pertaining to peace. But for the past few years, they have been acting just contrary to those original agreements that they originally started with during the Reagan and the Bush era, and it has escalated and become tainted, and now it has gotten worse and worse and worse. The next thing you know, are we going to have one of them in the White House? dictating and dominating and telling the American people towards how to live and where to go and where not to go and how we're going to worship and where we're going to worship and who we're going to worship. God bless America. And God bless our ancestors for understanding the difference between right and wrong. 239 now going on 240 years ago whenever they stood up against this type of tyranny. Whenever they stood up against this type of aggression. God bless the United States of America towards what she still to this day stands for. And don't let nobody
I don't care who they are. I don't care in what type of position that they're in. Don't let nobody tell you any different. The same way as God instructed Moses to the Pharaohs. What you're doing is wrong and let my people go. Let my people go so they can worship, so they can be of their own descent, so that they can be their own stewards of their own lives, so that they can choose whether or not they want to be this way or that way. Mr. Maloney, um, thank you both for being here. Um, you know, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, this may be one of your first congressional hearings like this, so um, you I may not understand. <laughs> I can't blame you for feeling that way, sir. Um, particularly when I've been sitting here listening to my Republican colleagues. You know, one of the advantages of being down here at the kids' table is that you get to hear the folks above you um, ask their questions. And I've been listening closely to my Republican colleagues, and I've heard them say just about everything um, except to contradict any of the substantive testimony you've both given. You may have noticed there's been a lot of complaints, and there's been a lot of insinuations, and there's been a lot of suggestions maybe that that your that your service is somehow not not to be trusted. You know, you were treated to questions about your loyalty because of some half baked job offer, I guess the Ukrainians made you, which you of course dutifully reported. I guess Mr. Castor is implying maybe you're uh, you've got some dual loyalty, which is of course an old smear we've heard many times in our history. They tried to demean He's not a double agent. He's not a double agent. Okay? He's very loyal to the original concepts of what our ancestors wanted to do for not only America, but for the world. Okay? You can set up our Mr. Maloney, and you can try to manipulate the truth all you want, which that's exactly what you're going to try to do, because you're for the Republicans and on the Republican side. You can try to manipulate it, twist it, turn it, taint it, corrupt it, Convince us through your mind-altering, spell-binding procedures that what this man is doing and has done is somehow or another tainted or wrong. But the fact of the matter is, what this man is doing is standing up to old ethnic rule. And the old core ethnic rule isn't that he has been manipulated. It's that the Republican Party has been manipulated. Just like you, Mr. Maloney. You have been corrupted. You have been warped. You have been bamboozled. You have compromised on your original oath. And because of that, you're looking at him like he is the compromiser. The one on the right. And it's not him that has been the compromiser. It's you, Mr. Maloney. It's you and your Republican Party as well as your chief and commander and our president that has become corrupted in thinking that it's okay, that it's all right in asking a foreign dictator to interfere, to meddle around in our affairs. And that's exactly what Donald J. Trump done. No ifs, no ands, no question marks. When you get to looking at the facts, this will be what the American people sees and understands that has occurred in this presidency. You as though maybe you're, you've overstated your importance of your job. And of course, you were 
this, the guy on the National Security Council responsible for directing Ukrainian policy. We've heard them air out some allegations with no basis in proof, but they just want to get them out there and hope maybe some of those strands of spaghetti, I guess, will stick on the wall if they keep throwing them. We've even had a member of this committee question, this is my favorite, question why you would wear your dress uniform today. Even though that dress uniform includes a badge, a, a breastplate that has a combat infantry badge on it and a Purple Heart metal ribbon. Seems like if anybody gets to wear their uniform, it's somebody who's got a breastplate with those commendations on it. So let's do it again. Let's do the substance. Can we do that? Because we've had a lot of a lot of dust kicked up. Ms. Williams, you heard the call with your own ears, right? Yes, sir. Not secondhand, not hearsay. You heard the president speak. You heard his voice on the call. Correct. And your conclusion was what he said about investigating the Bidens was your words, unusual and inappropriate, I believe. Am I, am I right? That was my testimony. And Mr. Vindman, you were treated to a July 10th meeting in the White House where you heard Ambassador Sondland raise investigations, conditioning a White House meeting on that, investigations that you thought were unduly political. I believe that's how you described them. And you went to NSC counsel and you reported it, right? Correct. And then later, you too were on the White House call, am I right? You heard it with your own ears. Correct. Not secondhand, not from somebody else, not hearsay, right? Correct. You heard the president's voice on the call. I want to bring up one other fact that your psychiatrist, your doctors, as well as even your scientists will tell you are a fact. And it's one of the reasons why that I believe that God allowed for the gospel to be written other than just by one person. The gospel is written by four different people. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And of course it wasn't until about 90 years later, 70 to 90 years later, of the birth of Christ, was whenever the gospel come into play pertaining to the book of Revelations by John the Revelator that was on the island of Patmos. Okay? So basically you got five different approaches. Five different opinions. Five different people that are expressing in five different categories, in five different ways, towards what they seen, what they heard, how they interpreted, what Christ either directly or indirectly pertaining to the Holy Spirit was indicating of present, past, and future events that was going to happen to humanity according to the Almighty. Five different approaches. Okay? Your court systems, your doctors, your psychiatry world will tell you that you can have five different people standing on a street corner and all five of them observing the same wreck an accident that occurs right in front of their very eyes. And for whatever reason, we still don't understand the, the psychic in behind this. But we know that it occurs. Out of those five people, we'll have five different approaches towards who hit their brakes first, who initiated the wreck, who went over the line, who was speeding, who wasn't speeding, they'll have five different approaches up onto the very same event. It kind of breaks it down to the fifth dimension, doesn't it? In other words, they can all agree, yes, there was a wreck. But whenever you get to looking at all the pros and cons pertaining to the wreck, they all have five different opinions towards who hit the brakes first, who was speeding, who deviated from the yellow line, etc., etc., etc. That's the reason why today, in the modern day era that we live in, we have a thing called 
cameras. We have a thing called video. We have a thing now called data that we can look at that will give the exact detail towards who was doing what during the time that they done them, okay? Whenever you're dealing with a situation like they are putting these two witnesses on the stand, once more, you don't actually have a recorder or a camera or some sort of documentation device that is registering each person's thoughts towards how that they are obtaining, receiving the information that they're receiving and obtaining it. And naturally, you're going to have two different opinions about the same call. Just like you have five different opinions about the gospel. Now they claim, looking at the gospel, the book of life, that the book of Luke has more of an intellect concept because Luke was considered of being some sort of a physician at the time, a doctor, and because of his education, he had a clearer way of defining what he was hearing and seeing and being a part of during the time that he was walking and talking with Christ. They claim the book of Luke has more of a clearer understanding. It's not to say that Matthew is wrong and Luke is right. It's not to say that John is wrong and Matthew is right. Or Mark was way off beat, but Matthew was right. They're all right. All five different concepts, all five opinions, all five different approaches to what they observed, what they witnessed, what they heard, in the way that they heard it and the way that they seen it is all correct. It's just a matter of being able to relate to that particular person because there are some that can relate to John's teachings better than they can Luke's teachings. There are some that can understand the book of Revelations in full detail, in depth. And there's others that whenever they read the book of Revelations, it's mumbo jumbo to them. They can't conceive it. They can't relate to it. They can't understand it. And because they can't understand it, most of them refuse to accept it. It's the same way with what's going on right here of how they're splitting straws. They're basically taking one person's opinion or one person's testimony over another and to be quite honest with you, I think it's really unfair because most of the time, whenever law enforcement has a scenario that's connecting two different people, let's say somebody gets shot, there was a witness and one person had actually done the shooting, or let's say that two people was doing the shooting, but there was more than one person. By and large, what law enforcement ordinarily does, they separate the two witnesses. They separate them, they put this person in this room, and put this person in this room, and see how they collaborate their story together. Or they see how that their story contradicts each other. It's the cleanest, best, simplest way of getting to the bottom, of getting to the truth. Because if you don't do that initially, then you'll have one that is counterproductive to the other, and they start getting antsy, they get a little nervous, it's like, oh my God, the cameras are on me here, I'm on the red carpet here, 
uh, maybe I didn't really interpret that the way that I said that I interpreted that while ago the same way. Maybe my mind was playing tricks with me, or maybe I was imagining what I was hearing. Because whenever you get to looking at something that you do not have a documentation device on, pertaining to actually hearing the conversation, feeling the pulse, knowing the blood pressure, experiencing what the he or she was experiencing during the time that they was experiencing it. Now you're talking about second guessing somebody's testimony. You know, I wasn't at the events that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was at. I wasn't there. I can only imagine what it had been like if I was there towards actually walking and talking with an individual that was, in fact, the only begotten son pertaining to Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I wasn't there on the island that was given the vision of the book of Revelations. But I can only imagine of what it would have been like if I was there. It leaves a broad perspective of one's imagination of what he or she would have felt, what that they would have interpreted, what that they would, how that they would have interpreted what was said during the time that it was said. It leaves a broad perspective towards how that these two people, right now, that are under, hypothetically speaking, they're under the gun, per se. They're walking them, they're making them walk the plank, as the old sailor would say. We're going to make you walk the plank, you're going to tell us the truth, and if you don't, we're going to push you off the plank and the sharks will eat you. You'll die. You'll drown. Frankly, I couldn't believe uh, what I was hearing. Um, it was probably an element of shock that uh, maybe in certain regards, my worst fear of how our Ukraine policy could play out uh, was playing out. Now this was likely to have uh, significant implications for U.S. national security. And you went immediately in other places all over the world in other places all over the world. And the reason why is possibly because maybe he understands the concept of superiority more so than she I does. Do. Read the last paragraph. I don't know for me why, again. but but the fact of the matter the is last one, the second to last one. Would you read that one again for me? Because I think the American But the fact of the matter is now they're playing mind games. They're playing word games. They're playing one testimony against another that's gonna make it that much more confusing for the American people to figure out. Now, one other thing before I flip it back on so you can hear it. One other thing. Doesn't the Bible say that the author of confusion is Satan? Why would they want to why would they not want to simplify this the same way as the FBI or other law enforcement agencies towards separating these two individuals rather than bringing them together? I rest my case. I rest my case because what and how that they're doing it is the incorrect way for them to be doing it, as far as I am concerned. There was the ultimate risk. And why do you have confidence that you can do that and tell your dad not to worry? Congressman, because this is America. This is the country I've served and defended, uh, that all my brothers have served and hear right matters. Thank you, sir. Yield back. Wow. Ms. Demings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, uh, Ms. Williams, let me thank you for your service to our nation. It, it truly matters. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Vinman, um, I had the honor of speaking to a group of veterans this past weekend. And what I said to them was that no words, no words are really adequate or sufficient 
to fully express our gratitude for their service to our nation. So Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, today I say to you, there are no words that are sufficient to fully express our gratitude to you for what you have done for our nation and amazingly what you are still willing to do for our nation. It is vitally important that the American people understand how President Trump's unethical demand that Ukraine deliver politically motivated investigations in exchange for military assistance created a security risk for our, the United States of America national security. The president was not just playing a political game by upholding military aid and, and meetings with Ukraine threatening the hundreds of millions of dollars of military assistance that Congress had appropriated has real life consequences for Ukraine and for the USA. In your deposition, Colonel Vindman, you testified, and I quote, a strong and independent Ukraine is critical to our security interests. Could you please explain why a strong and independent Ukraine is so critical and why it is so vital to U.S. interests? We sometimes refer to Ukraine as a um, frontline state. Uh, it's on the front line of um, Europe. It's, they have actually described to me, the Ukrainians, that, that is, it, it is a, they, treat, they consider themselves as a barrier between Russian aggression and Europe. And what I've heard them describe is the need for U.S. support in order to serve this role, in order to protect European and Western security. Lieutenant Colonel, this is not just a theoretical conflict between Ukraine and Russia. You've already said this morning that Russia is actively fighting to expand into Ukraine, that Ukraine is in a hot roar, war with Russia right now. Is that correct? It's stable, but it's still a hot war. And isn't it true, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, that even if the security assistance was eventually delivered to Ukraine, the fact that it was delayed, just that fact, could signal to Russia that the bond between Ukraine and the U.S. was weakening? That was the concern of myself and my colleagues. And was the risk of even the appearance that the U.S.-Ukraine bond is shaky is that it could embolden Russia to act with more aggression. Would you say that's correct? I believe that was my testimony. Just last month during an interview, President Putin joked about interfering in our political elections. I can only guess that's what we have become to Russia and its president. I think he felt emboldened by the president's reckless actions both attempts to hold critical military aid from Ukraine and President Trump's effort to blame uh, Ukraine, not Russia, for election interference. Ms. Williams and Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, I can only say that every American, regardless of our politics, should be critically concerned about that. And let me just say this, yes, we do trust the American people. But you know what? The American people trust us yes. to as members of Congress yes. to support, protect, and defend yes. the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, yes. foreign and domestic. Yes. And we intend to do just that. Thank you again for your service, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Christian Murphy. Good afternoon, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman and Ms. Williams. Thank you for your service. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, I'm concerned that your loyalty has been questioned not just because you're bringing forward evidence of wrongdoing against the President, President of the United States, but because you're an immigrant. Uh, recently, Fox News host Brian Kilmeade oh, said, he, meaning you, were born in the Soviet Union, emigrated with his family young. We was all immigrants. 
We was all immigrants at one time pertaining to our original bloodlines. Unless you're Native American. Now, if you can prove that you got Indian in you. I came to this country when I was three months. If you can prove that you got Indian in you, then you're not an immigrant. But if you can't prove that you got Indian in you, even if it's one little bitty ounce of Indian, guess what? We're all immigrants. Embracing what it means to be an American, correct? That is correct. All your childhood memories relate to being an American, correct? That is correct. You and your family faced difficult times during your childhood, correct? Yes. I can relate, that's my story too. But your father went on to become an engineer, right? He uh, reestablished himself in his former pro profession in, in the United States. I can relate. I, I got a BS in engineering. Of course, some people claim I practice the BS part now. <laughs> Your father never gave up working hard to build his very own American dream, did he? He did not. Well, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, your father achieved the American dream, and so did you and your family. From one immigrant American to another immigrant American, I want to say to you, that you and your family represent the very best of America. Yes. I assume that you are as proud <clears throat> to be an American as I am, correct? Yes, sir. And maybe more so. <clears throat> sir, I want to uh, turn your attention to uh, Yuri Litsenko. Um, you called him a disruptive actor in your opening statement, correct? Correct. Um, Mr. Lutsenko, the former prosecutor general in Ukraine, has made various claims about various Americans, right? Correct. You are unaware of any factual basis for his accusations against Ambassador Yovanovitch, right? Correct. He also was a source for an article by John Solomon in The Hill, right? That is correct. And you said that key elements of that article, as well as his accusations, are false, right? Correct. Lusenko is not a credible source, correct? Correct. Sir, the other side claims that there was absolutely no pressure on this July 25th phone call. I think that's what we heard earlier, right? I believe so. And uh, you have termed what President Trump asked in terms of investigations on that phone call as a demand, correct? Correct. And you've pointed out the large power disparity between President Trump on the one hand and Pre President Zelensky on the other, correct? Yes. There was pressure on that phone call, right? The, the Ukrainians needed the meeting. The Ukrainians subsequently, when they found out about it, needed the security assistance. So they, pressure was brought to bear on them, correct? I believe so. Sir, Colonel Vindman, last week we heard a decorated military veteran, namely Ambassador Bill Taylor, come before us. You know, if there was ever a time that the Ukrainians needed support coming from the United States President, it was right then, during the time that they had just got through recently electing a brand new president. On his... Have you ever heard the old saying, you kick them while they're down? Kick them while they're down? That's almost like what the President of the United States was doing. They was going through uncertain waters at that time. And and if if any time for a President to have been supporting the people of Ukraine, he should have been uplifting the President of Ukraine rather than... I think you know the tale. Ambassador Taylor? I do. I then asked Ambassador Taylor, quote, could that type of conduct trigger a court martial? Ambassador Taylor said, yes, sir. Do you agree with Ambassador Taylor, Colonel Vindman? I do. Thank you for your service. Concludes the member questioning. Uh, Representative Nunes, your In subordination. Uh, your concluding remarks. In subordination. Well, act one of today's circus is over. Uh, for those of you who have been watching it at home, the Democrats are no closer to impeachment than where they were three years ago. In the process, they've the Department of Justice, FBI, State Department, elements within the IC, the ICIG, have all suffered long-term damage. The Democrats can continue. 
it's hard to charge the leader of the group, the president of insubordination, whenever he's the one that's supposed to be making the rules. He's the one that's supposed to be abiding by the old rules. He's the one that's supposed to be abiding by the old practices of the old rules, going all the way back 239 years ago, 240 years ago, whenever our democracy was first birthed into an existence. It's difficult to charge the very person that's in charge of insubordination whenever they're the ones that's compromising on the rules, when they're the ones that's doing these type of inappropriate acts. Evidence you presented as well as others uh, thus far in the impeachment inquiry. First of all, uh, I want to join my colleagues in uh, thanking you, uh, Colonel Vindman, uh, for your military service. Um, and I should tell you that notwithstanding all of the questions you got on why didn't you go talk to your supervisor, why didn't you go talk to Mr. Morrison, why did you go to the national security lawyer, as if there's something wrong with going to the national security lawyer, are you aware that we asked Mr. Morrison whether he went to the national security lawyer right after the call and that he did? I am. And are you aware also that we asked him, well, if you had this problem with Colonel Vindman not going to you instead of the lawyer, naturally you must have gone to your supervisor, and your answer was, he didn't go to his supervisor either. He went directly to the National Security Council lawyer, so I hope my colleagues will give him the same hard time for not following his chain of command that he complained about with you, apparently. Um, the president may attack you, and has. Others on right-wing TV might attack you, and they have. But I thought you should know, and maybe you know already, that this is what the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff had to say about you, Colonel Vindman. He is a professional, competent, patriotic, and loyal officer. He has made an extraordinary contribution to the security of our nation in both peacetime and combat. Uh, I'm sure your dad is proud to hear that. Um, my colleagues have tried to make the argument here today, and we've heard it before, that the president was just interested in fighting corruption. Uh, that's our goal, fighting corruption in Ukraine, this terribly corrupt country. The problem, of course, with that is there's no evidence of the president trying to fight corruption. The evidence all points in the other direction. The evidence points in the direction of the president inviting Ukraine to engage in the corrupt act of investigating a U.S. political opponent. Ambassador Yovanovitch was known as a strong fighter of corruption, so what does the president do? He recalls her from her post. Exactly. Ambassador Yovanovitch, in fact, was at a meeting celebrating other anti-corruption fighters, including a woman who had acid thrown in her face on the day she was told to get on the next plane back to Washington. You prepare talking points for the president's first conversation with Zelensky. He's supposed to talk about rooting out corruption. If this president had such a deep interest in rooting out corruption in Ukraine, surely he would have brought it up on the call, but of course we now know that he did not. We then see Rudy Giuliani not fighting corruption, but asking for an investigation of the Bidens. And my colleagues say, well, maybe he was acting on his own. Even though he says he's acting as the president's lawyer, maybe he was really acting on his own. But the two investigations that Rudy Giuliani wanted come up in the meeting you participate in on July 10th at the White House, when Ambassador Sondland brings up the Bidens and Burisma in 2016, tells the Ukrainians who want that meeting in the White House, you got to do these investigations. Now they would say Ambassador Sondland was acting on his own, but that doesn't quite work either because we have the call record from July 25th, which the president was forced to release, in which the president doesn't bring up corruption. He doesn't say how those anti-corruption courts going or great work in the RADA. Of course not. What does the president say? I want you to invest the, investigate the Bidens and this debunk conspiracy theory pushed by Vladimir Putin. That also helps me in my re-election. So much for fighting corruption. 
the message to Ukraine, the real message to Ukraine, our U.S. policy message is, don't engage in political investigations. The message from the president, however, was the exact opposite. Do engage in political investigations and do it for my reelection. And it's also made clear if they want the White House meeting and ultimately if they want 400 million in U.S. aid, this is what they have to do. The only lament I hear from my colleagues is it wasn't successful. They got caught. They got tainted. They didn't get the political investigations and they still had to release the money. Now they still haven't gotten the White House meeting, but they had to release the money because a whistleblower blew the whistle. Whistleblower the president wants to punish. And because Congress announced it was doing investigations and very soon thereafter, the president was forced to lift the hold on the aid. They argue, well, this makes it, this makes it okay that it was a failed effort to bribe Ukraine, a failed effort to extort Ukraine. That doesn't make it better. It's no less odious because it was discovered and it was stopped. And we have courageous people like yourself who come forward, who report things, who do what they should do, who have a sense, as you put it, Colonel, of duty, of duty, not to the person of the president, but to the presidency and to the country. Yes, to the people. And we thank you for that. At the end of the day, I think this all comes back to something we heard from another career Foreign Service officer just last Friday in a conversation he overheard with the president in a restaurant in Ukraine in which the president, not Rudy Giuliani, not anyone else, the president of the United States wanted to know, are they going to do the investigations? This is the day after that July 25th call. Are they going to do the investigations? And he's assured by Ambassador Sondland they're going to do it. And what does Sondland relate to this Foreign Service officer after he hangs up that call? The president doesn't give a expletive about Ukraine. He only cares about the big things that help his personal interests. That's all you need to know. And it isn't just about Ukraine, of course. Ukraine is fighting our fight against the Russians, against their expansionism. That's our fight too. That's our fight too. At least we thought so on a bipartisan basis. That's our fight too. That's why we support Ukraine with the military aid that we have. Well, the president may not care about it, but we do. We care about our defense. We care about the defense of our allies. And we darn well care about our Constitution. We are adjourned. And please ask the, the audience to allow the witnesses and the members who have to go vote to leave uh, first. Good afternoon. It's an emotional end to what we've been watching all day. I'm Nicole Wallace. We've all been watching the third day of public testimony and the impeachment inquiry into Donald J. Trump. The questioning of Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman became increasingly acrimonious this afternoon as Republicans sought to undermine his credibility, going after everything from his request to be addressed by his military rank to his job performance. But in an emotional exchange just a few minutes ago, one that prompted spontaneous applause in the room, Vindman made clear why he was willing to sit there today and endure those attacks. It was for the good of the country that he has served and defended, the country his father risked everything to reach after leaving the Soviet Union, seeking a better life for his family. Colonel Vindman was a first-hand witness on that July 25th call, along with Jennifer Williams from the Vice President's staff, who testified alongside him today. That call, unbeknownst to them, would end up at the center of the impeachment into Donald Trump, putting them at the center as well. Let me just read um, from what prompted that spontaneous round of applause. The only other time we've seen that was at the end of a day of testimony from Marie Yovanovitch. Vindman saying, this is America. This is the country I've served and defended, that all my brothers have served and defended, and here, right matters. 
joining us today, MSNBC Chief Legal Correspondent, host of The Beat, Ari Melber. We're also joined by MSNBC Legal Analyst, Maya Wiley, who previously worked in the Civil Division of the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York. Former Democratic Senator from Missouri and current MSNBC Political Analyst, Claire McCaskill. Former U.S. Attorney, now Professor at the University of Alabama School of Law. Also an MSNBC contributor, Joyce Vance. MSNBC National Security Analyst, Jeremy Bash, who served as former Chief of Staff at the CIA and the Department of Defense joins us, and MSNBC National Security Analyst Ned Price is a former Senior Director and Spokesperson for the National Security Council, where Alexander Bingham worked. Jeremy Bash, let me start with you. All day long, a theme kept coming out whether Republicans wanted it to or not. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman has a single ideology, and it is patriotism and service to the United States. That seemed to be this inconvenient fact that Republicans kept trying to squash and quash and smear. In your view, do you think they landed any punches? What do you think the impact was of this first session of testimony today? Well, Nicole, I thought Colonel Vindman was very effective. Per his training, per the way he was taught uh, in the United States Army, he told the truth. He laid out the facts. He talked about the fact that Gordon Sondland had told the Ukrainians that unless they investigated the Bidens, they would not receive military aid. And right away, Colonel Vindman reported that inappropriate, unlawful conduct to the Council of the National Security Council. And further, when he heard the phone call by the president, he did the same. And he did something very courageous, perhaps even more courageous than his own service in the battle zone. He spoke out today against the most powerful person in our country and possibly the world, the commander in chief, the president, and he did it because, as he said, here right matters. I thought he was highly effective. The state of the Republican defense also hasn't changed. Nicole, in some ways, uh, you know, they, they've tried to defend this and said there was no quid pro quo. Colonel Vindman and others said actually there was. They've tried to say this wasn't a demand, it was a favor. Colonel Vindman said no, it was a demand. And so I think really the state of the defense is where Representative Stefanik said, which is it was appropriate for the president to make this request to Zelensky. And I think that's going to be the heart of the matter, which is whether it is appropriate for a president to use his office, to use taxpayer money, to use military aid, to demand investigations of political rivals. If Republicans think that's OK, they're going to stay on the president's side. If they don't think it's OK, they have a reason to break. We're watching um, Ms. Will Jennifer Williams depart. She was on the vice president's staff. Jeremy Bash, she unequivocally testified today that there was no national security purpose for withholding the military aid. She also deprived Republicans of any semblance of an excuse that there was a substantive reason, that there was a policy check. Even in the questioning of Congresswoman Stefanik, which was sharp and well prepared, um, both witnesses testified to the fact that the Ukrainians had checked off all of the boxes. They'd been certified. I think it's by the Department of Defense that they had taken the appropriate actions to address any questions or concerns about corruption. Is that your understanding? Yeah, that, that's right, Nicole. In fact, again, that's the heart of the issue. And Jennifer Williams, who is on Vice President's staff uh, on detail from the State Department, a career professional, made clear there's no reason any policy reason, no defense reason, no diplomatic reason, no economic reason for the United States and the president to launch investigations of his political rivals. It's, it's not only inappropriate, it's wrong. She said uh, she found it inappropriate that the president would utilize uh, this channel to demand investigations into political rivals. And I think, again, the Republicans, that's the state of their defense. They have to defend the substantive conduct by the president. They have nowhere else to go here. They can try to tear Colonel Vimmon down. They can try to say he's not American. They can try to say he's not a soldier. But that's what they're left to, which is defending Donald Trump's conduct. And Nicole, uh, just jumping in, uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't comment on what we just saw on the camera for folks watching at home, which was uh, Jennifer Williams uh, walking out of this landmark day of testimony, going up against the President of the United States along with Colonel Vindman, and she walked out and she held a cab. She hopped, <laughs> she hopped into a red Washington, D.C. cab, uh, which reminds you that these people, these are individuals, uh, the Colonel obviously still a member of the U.S. military and has extra security and a little different, uh, but they're both facing all kinds of pressure and some threats. 
uh, the whistleblower remains anonymous under the same type of concern, and yet they don't have all the support and power and prestige uh, full-time of the presidency. She hops in a red cab, and she drives off with the rest of her day. I mean, before we get to the law and the bribery conspiracy, I just think that's such a portrait of the public service we saw today, and I think that resonates with people. You know, and the window into what their lives are like now is also remarkable. Colonel Vinman saying he's not sure that there's been any retribution, but there's some meetings he hasn't been included in. Mm. So paying a price for his patriotism in real time. Uh, paying the price, and that goes to this clear dividing line within the United States government under the Trump administration as this plot escalated. Uh, Donald Trump Jr. not known for his thoughts on uh, ambassadors around the world. The president not known to memorize the names of ambassadors, let alone their background. Uh, and yet, and here was looking at another, uh, I believe, another cab hailing. So again, <laughs> this is not people jumping into secured armored beast vehicles the way some of the top officials in, in, in the administration get to. These are uh, public servants. They serve in both parties. Um, Senator, Senator, I wanted to ask you, looking at the hearing today, we basically saw the way the Intelligence Committee operates when the cameras are on. This is a committee that has been famously credited, perhaps in other eras, pre-Trump, uh, for a type of decency and bipartisanship, as Nicole and others have, have noted, that was gone today. What did you think in particular of the roles of the two parties during an investigation where, I would note, uh, they didn't land a lot of substantive line of questioning against uh, these witnesses. Yeah, in the era of Trump, um, it, more than just the norms of the White House that have been so disrupted, so have the norms of Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in the Senate, the Intelligence Committee and the Armed Services Committee are still holding on by their fingernails to some bipartisanship. That's gone in the House. I mean, today was Exhibit A. You saw absolutely no one, even Will Hurd, um, has now jumped into the pool, and it, no one is standing up and actually saying, hey, wait a minute, L let's don't try to trash this guy. I, I'm just going to tell you this. I want this guy and his brother protecting me. Mm -hmm. I want them um, standing up for America. Uh, they may not have the, they may be hailing cabs, Barry. <laughs> they may not have the power of the people who roll up to the Capitol with five or six SUVs and people with guns. I'll tell you what they have that the president doesn't have. They have character. Mm -hmm. uh, they have character. And that was on full display today. And frankly, what became so obvious by the end of the hearing, the Republicans have nothing. Yeah. They've got nothing. They can't say hearsay anymore. They can't like say that the whistleblower is on some kind of political jihad because he's been corroborated or she has been corroborated over and over again. They've got nothing left other than the media sucks and the Democrats don't like the president. And that is not a very good defense of selling national security for your political purposes. You know, Jeremy, I'm struck by the, as Clarice was talking about, by, by the corroboration. And, and, and I think it sort of leaves you wondering, the Republicans are now willing to sacrifice the reputations of five patriots. Oh, we don't have Jeremy Bash. Ned Price, let me bring this to you. You worked on that National Security Council staff as its spokesperson. What does it say to you that these people, Juan Zarate, who worked in, in the Bush uh, National Security Council for the same president I served, was talking about Colonel Vindman as, as the best of the best, that when you work for a president on the National Security Council staff, you get to bring in the best of the best. Colonel Vindman was the best of the best when it came to his expertise uh, in U.S.-Ukrainian relations. What does it say to you to see, as, as Ari's saying, every Republican on this committee willing to question not just his expertise, not just his patriotism, but his loyalties? Nobody objected to that line of questioning. They didn't all repeat it. But nobody said, hey, I take issue with my Republican colleagues questioning of your patriotism and your loyalty. Yeah, you know, Nicole, as you said, I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to serve on the National Security Council staff where Lieutenant Colonel Vindman is now. And I can say unequivocally that we heard Republicans today attacking the Lieutenant Colonel for doing one thing and one thing only and frankly doing it well. And that's doing his job as a director on the National Security Council staff. And that's because the National Security Council is really the fulcrum of the interagency within the executive branch, connecting the State Department with the intelligence community, with 
with the Treasury Department, and so forth and so on, to make sure that uh, within an administration, the left hand knows what the right hand is doing. And so when Republicans try to smear and malign Lieutenant Colonel Venman for talking to someone at the Department of State, for talking to someone at the intelligence community, uh, that is essentially uh, smearing and maligning him for doing what he's supposed to do. And actually, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel Venman, I thought, uh, was quite explicit on that front. He said uh, to Representative Jim Jordan, I was doing my job. They also underlined another point that I don't actually think uh, is as exculpatory for the president, certainly not in the way they intended. We heard Republicans underline the fact that Lieutenant Colonel Vindman has never met President Trump. And that in itself is striking because this is the key person who's supposed to coordinate Ukraine policy for the administration. Ukraine policy, uh, certainly for the wrong reasons, but Ukraine policy is something that President Trump has shown great interest in. I think that just underscores the fact that President Trump is not in this for national security. He's not in this out of foreign policy interests. He's in this for his own interests. And finally, Nicole, if I could, if I could just say, you know, this is a dark <clears throat> moment for our our country. We're uh, witnessing an impeachment of a president uh, for doing something that uh, I think is absolutely shameful. But, you know, I have to say, and it's almost ironic, that there have been moments in the course of this where, you know, it sort of stiffens your spine and you swell with pride at being an American. And I felt that way today when I heard Lieutenant Colonel uh, Vindman talk about America and his family's coming here and his brother's service and saying in America, uh, in, in America, here, right Right matters. I think that was one of those moments. Let's listen to that. Frankly, I couldn't believe uh, what I was hearing. Um, it was probably an element of shock that uh, maybe in certain regards, my worst fear of how our Ukraine policy could play out uh, was playing out. And how this was likely to have uh, significant implications for U.S. national security. Dad, my sitting here today in the U.S. Capitol talking to our elected officials is proof that you made the right decision 40 years ago to leave the Soviet Union and come here to the United States of America in search of a better life for our family. Do not worry, I'll be fine for telling the truth. You realize when you came forward out of sense of duty that you were putting yourself in direct opposition to the most powerful person in the world. Do you realize that, sir? I knew I was assuming a lot of risk. And I'm struck by that word, don't worry, that phrase, do not worry, you addressed to your dad. Was your dad a warrior? Uh, he did serve. It was a different military, though. And he would have worried if you were putting yourself up against the President of the United States, is that right? He deeply worried about it, because in his context, there was, there was the ultimate risk. And why do you have confidence that you can do that and tell your dad not to worry? Congressman, because this is America. This is the country I've served and defended, uh, that all my brothers have served, and here, right matters. Thank you, sir. Yield back. It's an incredible moment. It was so striking, and it's a reminder of why these hearings mattered, to, to right. see these people and see them with our own eyes. That was really the moment where you saw the sloganeering of Make America Great Again lined up against the people who actually live the American mm. dream. Mm -hmm. And they serve, and they sometimes come from other countries, mm -hmm. as long as they are loyal and serve America. That is the American dream, and it always has been in its best days, is when we welcome those people in. As Maya and others have mentioned, this is someone who is part of a, a Jewish minority fleeing oppression that was welcomed here, and a presence in both parties. Uh, indeed, law and rhetoric have historically welcome people, the Bush and Reagan administrations mm -hmm. protecting asylum protections. Now, that's a wider ambit for the narrower case that was being made through Vindman. And what I thought was also so striking is, today really dispensed with the euphemisms. Uh, diplomats are great. They're good at euphemism because sometimes it helps avoid problems. Um, you don't get that as much from the, some of the military national security folks. These people make decisions that take lives. They kill people in battle. And then there are hard calls to make, they go through the chain of command. Their first instinct, I could tell you, as you've been around government and so have I and covering it as well, the first instinct isn't go to the lawyers. They make hard calls, drone calls, mm -hmm. military calls, CIA calls. When those folks go to the lawyers, it's because something's way over the line. In this case, there was not a defensible explanation, there was not a defensible reason to condition anything in the US government power 
weapons, military money, government meetings at the White House to help the incumbent president get reelected. Indeed, that undermines the democracy in the view of these firsthand witnesses. That's what's so powerful. Does that mean that Donald Trump committed an impeachable offense? I don't know. We have a system where the Congress adjudicates that. But today was by far the most devastating day because of those people in blunt and plain and often patriotic, plain English, explaining why they stood up then and why they stand up now at considerable risk. And I mean, I just have to add, Joyce, it's really hard when you work on a White House staff to sort of, you know, the reason that there are so as few eyewitnesses as there are is because it's very difficult to do what he did. It's very difficult to take yourself upstairs to the White House Counsel's Office and sound the alarm about what he saw. But, but it's, to, to Ari's point, it's that really sharp distinction in Colonel Vindman's mind between right and wrong that propelled him up the stairs, if it's still upstairs, to the White House Counsel's Office. You know, I think at a point in time in our country when we've looked at so much that comes out of this White House and felt like it was quintessentially un-American that today Alexander Vindman gave the country an opportunity to reclaim patriotism. You watch his testimony, he's who you want your children to grow up to be. He's brave, he's righteous, and I think to your point, a lot of folks in government see conduct that makes them uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Alexander Vindman didn't just go back and sit behind his desk. He took it to the person in his chain of command who he was supposed to go to. And we saw quibbling from the Republicans on that point that he didn't go to Morrison, his direct report. He went to the lawyers. That's where you're supposed to go when this happens. And he did it perhaps less because he saw illegality. Vindman is not a lawyer. But he knew that a strong Ukraine was critical to the United States' national security. And he stood up to protect our country. We should all be standing up and cheering like the folks in, in the room did. You know, and Maya, the, 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 the Republican attempt to make